We are live. Welcome to Star Wars Episode 8 Review and Thoughts, The Last Jedi. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a Star Wars movie divided the fandom. I'm not saying everyone criticizing this movie is wrong, and I will try to address some of the criticisms. Certainly, I think there is some validity to the claim that whether you agree with the themes and messages of the movie, as I do, or whether you do not, some of it is clumsily handled. Way too many people on both sides focus primarily on whether they do or do not agree with the themes and messages of the movie, and it hurts both sides that there is so much hyperbole. Again, on both sides. I will get into some detail about some of these issues. And I want to make sure to say this early on in the video, I don't think that subverting expectations is automatically clever and makes for good art. Or a betrayal that shows that you don't care about the fan base. It can be either and it can be any number of things in between those two extremes. Now, it is true that in a number of ways this movie is different than the other Star Wars movies, and that is intentional. But it's very clear that director and screenwriter Ryan Johnson and producer Kathleen Kennedy have tremendous affection of Star Wars and an understanding of Star Wars. And the movie does still deliver many of the things that we expect from a Star Wars, you know, episode movie. Yeah. Now, it makes a lot of sense to try to follow up The Force Awakens by doing something that feels less like one of the movies of the original trilogy, and certainly feels less like Episode 4. I do understand why some people didn't want a deconstruction of something they had a fairly straightforward love of, why it felt like they were being attacked for loving it by the movie itself. I'm not claiming that this movie is perfect, but the negative reaction against the movie you know, it might sadly mean that it will be a while before another Star Wars movie. And and to some extent also the, the Disney Plus shows, although, you know, I watched the first episode of The Mandalorian a couple of days ago, and that certainly did do things that I was not, you know, based on having watched, you know, Star Wars Episode Seven, I was not expecting Star Wars to get, I wasn't expecting Disney Star Wars to get so original trilogy Star Wars, and so gritty. Anyway, it might be a while before one of these movies really does something creative with Star Wars again. I'm not going to spoil Episode 9 in this video, but it's not a spoiler to say that it is a much more conventional Star Wars movie than this is. I don't hate fans of any of the trilogies, or the trilogies themselves, and I don't think that any of the fandoms are, you know, purely made up of people who hate those who disagree with them, those who have other values than them. If you express a viewpoint that, you know, disagrees with something I say in this video in the comment section, the only thing I'll ask is be respectful, and I'll be respectful in my answer. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or towards a minority or, you know, etc., etc., I'm probably just going to ignore you. There is a huge amount of things to talk about in this movie, so I'm going to say right up here front, up at the start of the video, I will definitely not be covering all of it. And there are other videos here on YouTube that do go into detail with a number of the things that I will not. Now, I acknowledge that some fans of the original trilogy feel that this movie is very alienating, but on the other hand, a number of people who are also fans really feel seen, feel, you know, acknowledged by this movie, and I think that's something really special. Make sure you watch A Star Wars is Born, Shallow Parody, Nerdist Presents. It's amazing. I, I found it when doing, you know, I, I searched for YouTube videos to make sure I get to, you know, as many of the, you know, to, yeah, to hear viewpoints, to, to hear 
what people liked and didn't like and arguments for and against certain things in these movies and that was one of the things that came up and yeah it's it's amazing I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. This is length. Check the time codes in the description box. Now, I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster for some of this video until my back feels better. I also have a splitting headache, so if you seem a little sluggish, that's why I'm going to try to power through it. In this video, I will be saying some negative things about conservatives. Some of what I'm going to be saying isn't about all conservatives. I'll usually be describing the kind of conservative I'm talking about. If what I describe doesn't describe you, then I'm not talking about you. Please try not to take it personally. If you're unhappy that I'm criticizing someone who technically belongs to your political party, instead of defending yourself and defending other people who, are, who I'm also not describing, and, and, you know, yeah. Criticize the people who are toxic instead of, you know, and, and try to persuade them to be better instead of getting defensive when you know, yeah. When when we progressives criticize them. Obviously, the things I say that do describe you, you're... Yeah. I'm, I'm not only going to be talking about the especially toxic. But a lot of it is the focus on the especially toxic. Now, this movie is a soft reboot. I try to grade any soft reboot on a curve. The reason why is the same reason I'm not on Twitter, because I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that it is inferior to the original. Is any soft reboot as good as the one or multiple movies it is, as it is a soft reboot of? Almost definitely not. If that exists, then I don't know of it. It's a soft reboot because they figure that it's a better way to ensure making a lot of money off it, but that doesn't have to mean that it's automatically bad, hence grading on a curve. I have to write something down really quickly. I promise I will not spend long. there. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, my day, my love of the original trilogy. First two parts of the original trilogy. And I personally don't mind when people who aren't big fans of Star Wars review them, comment on them, that kind of thing, but I know for some people it is very important that only fans do, and because of that I want to underline, I, you know, I criticize Star Wars, but I am a really big fan of some of Star Wars, and starting with my, so, so yeah, I have watched the, the Star Wars movies leading up to and including this one. I have not yet watched Solo or Rise of Skywalker. And yes, I realize I earlier criticized Rise of Skywalker early in this video, but I'm going off of what I've heard by others. Now, my ratings for the Star Wars movies that I've watched. Episodes 4 and 5 are 10 out of 10. Episode 6 is a 6. All three prequels are 5 out of 10. Episode 7 is a 7, Rogue One is an 8. I'm going to rate this particular movie at the very end of the review, but I like to... I sometimes change... I, I My 
final decision on exactly what I rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10. I, I make the final decision when I'm at the very end of the review. So I've just been talking through the entire movie. That helps me figure out exactly what I want to rate it. So that's when I will end at the end. Will, yeah, Once I've given it the, the rating, I will also update the following ranking. But stating ranking so that you know what you're... Yeah. Ranking the Star Wars movies worst to best. Episodes 2, 3, 1, 6, 7, Rogue One, and Episodes 4 and 5. My making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, or me wanting to... You know, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to ruin it for anyone. I simply find it very difficult not to ms 3 k and overanalyze everything I watch. Yeah, my, my criticizing things or doing jokes is not supposed to make you hate the thing I'm criticizing or making jokes about. I'm not going out of my way to avoid or attract negative attention by those who disagree with my political views. I'm not interested in telling someone they're stupid or making them feel stupid for liking or disliking something. I, I criticize because I feel that if we, when we don't criticize pieces of creative expression, that means that we're not, it's never going to get any better. Now, one of the appeals of Star Wars is that you can have wild concepts and have them play off each other. For example, magic power versus robots, and yeah, this this delivers on that. Another major appeal with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than more, like, just a drama set on Earth could. And yeah, this also does that. Now, there, there are compelling interpersonal conflicts between the people on the same side. And, right, yeah, content warning and or trigger warning. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting. Xenophobia, murder, body horror, uh, and slavery. Right, and and bullying and other abuse. Now, the this movie is rated PG thirteen, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, in such as clips of the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this movie and I just didn't pay extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the rest of the Star Wars movies, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this are for criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, in a lot of ways, this movie is like The Force Awakens. No, really. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another, so I'm not just repeating myself. I Obviously, there are some really significant differences, but, you know, the whole soft reboot thing, instead of me going over that, yeah. Now, in order to really appreciate this movie, you do need to have watched, at the very least, the original trilogy and The Force Awakens, and honestly, I verily, very, verily? Old English, I very rarely, there we go, recommend anyone actually watch the prequel trilogy. But I will say that there are things in this movie that you will appreciate more if you have watched the prequel trilogy. And certainly, if you're ever going to watch the prequel trilogy, 
you'll want to do it before this one, so that, because because this one spoils some of it, which, you know, it's for people who've already watched it. I have to admit, I, I wasn't really sure how much they were going to, I had heard before, but before I heard, before watching this movie, but before I heard, I kind of thought the sequel trilogy was just going to present the prequels did not exist, but no, this movie very clearly, uh, like, yeah, for sure, according to this movie, the prequels happened, and they happened the way that we saw them. Now, that, right, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say is during the visual, bleh, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is my very first viewing of this movie, and between, like, between the end credits finishing rolling and me recording this video, like, I had lunch, and then I recorded the video on the very first, you know, season one, episode one of The Mandalorian. That's it. So it is very fresh in my mind. And before you say, you know, oh, the then you can't have had enough time to think about the, the you know, the issues with the film, I knew almost everything going in. Like, I've watched a lot of videos that spoil absolutely everything, and I did that on purpose. So, you know, and, and honestly, I'm, I wasn't sure how much of an impact the movie was going to end up having on me after knowing absolutely everything going in. But it's still, like, really, I, I, I really love this movie. So, yeah. The, the, the thing that I was gonna, yeah, and, and just briefly for, you know, I also knew most things going into episode seven, and, and I don't think that was why it didn't have as much like, that movie just didn't get to me as much. But yeah, the, the, you know, if, yeah, if you're watching this video and you didn't watch my video, or you forgot my video on episode 7, actually, come to think of it, did I, no, yeah, yeah, I said it in that video. I did not originally watch, you know, any of the most recent Disney, you know, yeah, any of the Disney Star Wars movies. I did not watch them when they first came out. From now on, I will. You know, the... the I don't know, are they still making that one that Patty Jenkins... I really hope that Patty Jenkins doesn't end up not getting to make a Star Wars movie just because of, you know, how, how badly... You know, yeah, Solo was, was quite badly... It did very badly. And... Both Solo and Rise of Skywalker were fairly negatively received. This one was negatively received by a lot of fans, but critics loved it, and a lot of other fans also loved it. Anyway, yeah, that's one reason Patty Jenkins might lose the chance to do a Star Wars movie, and the other is, at the end of the day, she was at least partially responsible, some would say may, mostly responsible, for the utter train wreck that is... Wonder Woman 1984, and I, I stand by, that movie is not bad because of the progressive stuff in it, it's bad despite it. Yeah. Did I say despite of it? Yeah, in spite of it or despite it, there we go. And the, uh, yeah, for years, I honestly was not sure if I was, if I was going to watch any Disney Star Wars at all, so... I watched reviews of them that spoiled everything because I wasn't I wasn't expecting to watch the movie so I didn't care that it was spoiled the way that you know like I just I only recently got a chance to watch Matrix 4 and I'm watching Scream 5 in a little under a week and you know for those I I avoided spoilers until I watched Matrix 4 and I'm avoiding spoilers for Scream 5 until I've watched it. Those, I've, I, I can't really imagine. I wasn't that, I wasn't super hopeful for Matrix 4, but I'm not going to spoil a Matrix thing before I actually experience it. 
the the only Matrix thing I've spoiled without experiencing it myself was that uh, MMORPG, which, for one thing, I'm probably never gonna play an MMORPG. I I don't. It just it's way too involved for for me. I would be way overthinking every single decision I made. And for another, when I watched spoilers of it, the game was already down, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that is... That's so... This movie picks up very soon after the events of Episode 7. And in part that is because, and you know, the, the, I, I didn't talk spoilers. Hold on. Did I talk spoilers? I don't think I, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm spoiling all the, the movies. I'm not spoiling this movie in this particular part of this video, not until I get into thought sections, but I am spoiling every Star Wars movie that has come out before this movie. Did I accidentally delete? Anyway. Maybe I accidentally skimmed through. This movie picks up very, very soon after the events of Episode 7, which, you know, hopefully you either already watched it or you know. Yeah, that one ends with Ray handing Luke his lightsaber. So, it it's kind of... Um, If they didn't pick up right away, then we wouldn't get to see how that plays out. And I know some people hated how that played out, but I kind of loved it. But I'll, I'll get into that in in the in the thoughts section anyway. And I've seen some criticize, you know, since this picks up so soon after episode seven. Episode 7 also has Starkiller Base be destroyed, and this movie, when, you know, when this movie starts, the First Order are, you know, chasing down the, the Resistance forces, and it, it seems like the, yeah, the First Order are really in a, in a much more powerful position here than, you know, I, I've, I've heard some say, well, they just lost Starkiller Base, how can they still be so powerful and for sure like the whole the political we still don't know how how powerful you know these these it's it's still way too vague how powerful they are compared to each other but ultimately the the yeah i'm still just trying to outline the plot here i keep going off on tangents bottom line Ray is still standing, you know, she's a girl, standing in front of a man, handing him his lightsaber. Meanwhile, the Resistance is trying to evacuate a planet, and the First Order show up with a huge amount of ships, very powerful, you know, several of those ships extremely powerful, and basically the the resistance can't quite get away and the the first order can't quite catch up to them either basically the first order is they're, they they're at the same speed so eventually the you know the resistance for the resistance ships will run out of fuel and you know will no longer you know i i I saw someone say, well, they're still going to move at least slightly. Yes, true, but it's not going to move as fast with with absolutely no engines running as it would with engines running on a high, you know, yeah, anyway. So, so yeah, the, the, the First Order are just waiting for the Resistance to run out of fuel, and then they'll overtake them, and that's it. So, it is, it's very... Like, the stakes are high from right away, and, yeah, I, I, I really, really love that, like, one of my biggest problems with The Force Awakens was I didn't feel like there was a threat to the, the, 
major characters. Like it's every single time they're they're presents a threat, they they take it out in cool Star Wars way and then move on. And and here, like going into the movie knowing how it ends, I still felt like how are they gonna get out of this? And that just like it, it it has this real sense that that things are yeah things seem legitimately hopeless like the the you yeah, you wonder how how they're going to be able to yeah and and you know it it is like the empire strikes back also had you know this it it really seemed like how how are they going to get out of this one and yeah i i and and it is again of course about hope because that is one of the major themes of star wars and Some have criticized how progressive the messages in the movie are. I have also heard criticism of how the movie handles the progressive messages, some of which I will address later in this video. I'm definitely not telling anyone what to believe politically or whether or not to enjoy the movie or agree with its politics, but I did hear at least one person say that the movie being left-wing might turn off right-wingers from enjoying the movie. I'm not telling you that you can't believe that, but I do think that if you're going to make that case, you have to at least acknowledge the fact that Star Wars, the movie series, I can't speak to the, the books or other extended universe, I played several of the games, as you can tell, you know, I'm, I'm speaking primarily of the, of the movies here, has always been explicitly left-wing. Yes, ultimately... Most of the diversity in the original trilogy boils down to aliens rather than actually casting very many women or people of color. But it is still there. The good guys are a diverse group coming from different cultures working together to stop white supremacists. It's pretty difficult not to read the Ewok versus Empire fight, childish as the Ewoks are, as criticism of the Vietnam War. In general, there is, there is a strong anti-war message in these movies. War is started by the bad guys. It hurts innocent people. The good guys only join in the war when democracy fails. The pro-war position is conservative. Parts of these movies can be read as criticism of Ronald Reagan. He said, welfare queen demonizing minorities. And Lucas responded with these movies with a very clear statement. Minorities save the galaxy. Ben Kenobi and Yoda, the characters in the original trilogy that George clearly thinks of as the closest to the idea of what a good person should be, are monks who th think everything through, who sacrifice themselves, and only ever use violence as an absolute last resort. I would argue that a fair assessment of an average conservative is close to the opposite. A warrior who acts on instinct and gut, who survives while leaving the enemy dead and uses violence the moment that they feel they or their freedoms are threatened. Strike me down and I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine, rather than wanting to take out the other person. Wars not make one great, rather than a, an obsession with proving that you are great by taking part in wars. I'm not saying that these movies have to be left-wing, but let's at least be honest, them being left-wing is simply the, you know, the sequel trilogy being left wing is just taking the the you know yeah following on the original trilogy now yeah the the let's see i i'm going to quote a fellow critic here George Lucas partially made Star Wars to criticize Nixon, to express that maybe we shouldn't blindly believe our authority figures, since Luke's father, his authority figure, is not good, except at the very end. Now, I really appreciate the diversity in the movie. You know, the, the Force Awakens already had some. This has even more, and yeah.
you know, I, I've seen some say that the original, you know, the original trilogy didn't have this much diversity. I wish it, I personally wish it did have this much diversity, but I, you know, if you look at the movies made back then, like, it just wasn't as widely accepted, and, you know, there's still some people who don't accept diversity in casting. You know, and, yeah, today we celebrate the diversity found in real life. Now... Yeah, so it's pretty terrible, I have to say, the following, but some people wouldn't watch this if they haven't already. If they aren't sure of the following, not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are major characters that fall into those categories. And yes, some of the straight white cis men are depicted as evil, but again, the original trilogy, like, the, the biggest difference between the villains... In, in this and episode 7, and then the original trilogy, is that they used to be older dudes, but they were always white men. Now... I don't think that this movie should... I'm, I'm glad that this movie did not give people what they expected or, you know what they wanted after years of loving the original trilogy. I'm really glad that it did something interesting instead. A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back were not trying to give audiences what they wanted. It was trying to give them something that they didn't expect, hadn't seen before. And that's the whole, like, you know, pe when, when the reason that Star Wars, the original episode four Star Wars, became such a huge thing was not that people went and said, wow, that's exactly what I knew I wanted. It's because people were like, you can make movies like this? You know, nobody had seen anything like it before. Nobody knew that that was what was gonna, you know, like, there were people who tried to talk George Lucas out of the whole thing. They were like, this this can't work. Nobody has seen something like this before. You know, and, and the critics were like, we've seen this many times before. You just, you took this, 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 and this, and put it all together. You can't do that. And, you know, audiences loved it. And I, I, you know, yeah, obviously today we love Empire Strikes Back. But when it came out, some people were like, that wasn't what I wanted from Star Wars. You know, and that's part of the reason that Return of the Jedi is so crowd-pleasing. You know, it, it gives you, like, okay, you want Luke as a Jedi? Fine, here we go. It's, you know, you want stuff to be lighter than, than Empire, fine, Ewoks, you know, and just, yeah. You know, I and the filmmakers wanted the sequels to, to also be new and different. And then they chicken out with episode 9 because of the re negative response that this got. And, yeah, I'm going to start by talking, continue by talking about writing. Now, this was written by Ryan Johnson, who, after this movie, you know, currently Knives Out 2 is in post-production, and Knives Out 3 is on IMDb listed as announced, and... Ryan Johnson is also listed as having written Untitled Star Wars Trilogy, Episodes 2 and 3. And they are also announced. But I'm not entirely sure if those are still happening. That, that was like back when, you know, when, when the producers were really loving what Ryan Johnson was delivering. I think, I'm not sure if, if that, you know, the idea of him doing an entire Star Wars Trilogy... Yeah, I think, I think that was before a lot of fans had negative reactions to, to this when it came, in, came out in the theaters. But yeah, he also wrote Knives Out, which at some point I'm probably going to... I mean, it has such an amazing cast. 
I love the genre of the the whodunits and just yeah. I I'm at at some point I'm probably gonna watch it. He also wrote Looper, The Brothers Bloom, and Brick. I've heard good things, but I haven't watched those movies. This is the only movie that he's written that I've watched. Now, let's see. I, I tried. I honestly did try. When I, when I heard that this movie was described as having just countless plot holes, I was like, maybe it does. And I went to Quora.com, you know, plotted in biggest plot holes in The Last Jedi. And a lot of the top... You know, the, the, if, if you don't know Quora.com, people can vote for answers. You know, when, when, you know, someone will put a question and then you can, you know, you can add, I, I, I'm not sure there's any limit to how many different people can answer it. And you can answer with a couple of words. You can answer with like 10 paragraphs if you want. And each answer, you know, people can vote on it. Each individual Quora member can vote and the top the top ones like a bunch of them weren't even plot holes they're just you know yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and quote a fellow yeah a little bit more and then i'll i'll quote a, a fellow critic who really sums it up well but yeah, yeah. What I want to say is, I I read through a bunch of them, and I was like, this a lot of this isn't even plot holes. Anyway, so I ended up I haven't read all the plot holes people post online because I just I felt like, well, yeah, th these do they these do not qualify as plot holes. A lot of the, you know, there's there's some sloppy writing. There's characters being consistently depicted as having character flaws. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to quote a poster on Quora.com. And, you know, something that helped restore my faith in humanity is that this was also an answer that was very highly voted on. You know, a lot of people voted for this. A plot hole is a gap or inconsistency in the storyline that goes against the flow of logic established by the story's plot. What people often claim to be plot holes are usually elements of the story that they either disliked or they applied real world logic to a story that is as far from the real world as you can get. Come on, this is a story where its main protagonist and antagonists are space wizards. Now, Disney Plus has a 152 minute commentary, yeah, commentary track for the movie with Ryan Johnson and no one else. Clearly, he put a lot of time, care, work, passion, and thought into the film. I get very little sense of an ego. You know, commentary tracks are often where that can really shine through. Like, as just a really brief, just just the briefest, I swear. But I want to say, was it Once Upon a Time in the West, I think? There was this commentary track of, like, a bunch of different filmmakers who were like, oh my god. Sergio Leone inspired. I would not be a filmmaker today if it were not for Sergio Leone. Meanwhile, one of them, I forget his name, but he directed Red Dawn, the original, and the very first Conan movie. Meanwhile, he's like, ah, oh, Leone, dude, begged me to work with him. And I was like, I don't know, dude. He's like, oh, you gotta work with him. I don't deserve to work with him. I don't know, I guess, you know, we ended up not working together. I don't even remember why, but dude begged me, ah, oh, just, the guy's dead, man. Have just the tiniest little bit of respect. I don't know, I don't know, maybe he did. I can't rule out that there's some chance that Sergio Leone begged, I want to say his name is John Milius, to work with him, but 
It's a commentary track for his movie. Like, what? what is that term? Don't crap where you eat? Like, it was just... What I'm saying is, that guy, huge ego, can't can't keep his mouth shut about how amazing he is. For like, I, I, I think he's on the commentary track for like 20 minutes, and it's the only thing he talks about. I honestly half wonder if like the people putting together the commentary track were like, wow, this guy really, he is making a complete ass of himself. This is kind of funny. We should, people should hear this. Because I, I feel like they could have chosen to just say, I don't know, like, uh, the audio of your recording got messed up. No, no, I'm sorry. We, there's just, there's no time left to record it. We got to get the, the DVD out on schedule. You know, the, the, ooh, we don't have, we don't have forever. Sorry, John, sorry. Ryan Johnson made the best movie he could the way he felt it would come out best. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but he didn't sabotage it on purpose. And again, maybe you're sitting there thinking, I never said, no, no. Maybe you didn't, but some people did. There are people out there who said that Ryan Johnson intentionally, and, and Kathleen Kennedy, intentionally destroyed Star Wars. And it's just like, why would they spend this much time and money and effort just to destroy it. like if they just didn't like it they they would have just put something on youtube whining about it or something but nobody spends this much money time effort and energy just to to ruin something for someone on, on purpose my i mean now i've seen some criticize the amount of coincidences in this movie that that mean that the plot can happen i would say that there are less fewer in this than there were in episode seven but there's still a lot and it's it's at least a little too many now yeah, so I already mentioned, you know, episode 7. I'm not saying there's nothing interesting about it. I wouldn't have given it a 7 out of 10 if I thought there was nothing to it. I rated it higher than the prequels. I rated it higher than episode 6. But ultimately, you know, it plays it too safe. Too afraid to take chances. This movie definitely takes chances. And, yeah, I definitely do prefer this one to episode seven and yes obviously it is possible to find a you know a happy medium between these two extremes but right now these are the two extremes we have and yeah i i definitely i i it's hard for me to overstate how much i enjoyed this and and like it not just enjoy because that's just an emotional response but i genuinely like I have a ton of respect for this movie. This is, I, I thought they did an incredible job on this movie. And, and episode seven, like, the craftsmanship is good, but, and I, I do think there's something interesting in the, the metatextuality, this, this thing of having the new characters being big fans of the old ones as a sort, because you're supposed to, you, you know, clearly we are supposed to put ourselves in the shoes of characters like Ray and Finn and Poe. So the fact that like Ray is fangirling over Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, you know, yeah, obviously that is like they could easily have not. They could so easily have just had them, you know, not know about them, you know, or or something, but they they specifically chose and and the new Darth Vader isn't a Darth Vader he's a Darth Vader wannabe he's a Darth Vader fanboy and that's that's interesting again they could so easily have just given us Vader again you know it would have been such an easy and obvious thing to do and they resisted the temptation they you know it's it's not often that a big company makes the decision that is less safe you know they, they want to make money 
these these movies cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make and even more to advertise to market they want to make that money back they want to they want to make a huge profit off that investment and they went ahead and made the new Darth Vader a kind of whiny insecure young man who can't control his anger like it's that's that's interesting like the old bad guy was this like I, I mean Darth Vader until like other than like the very end the very end of his and, and you know his, his youth in the prequels episodes four and five like Vader is just a non-stop unstoppable badass you know he is terrifying he is is just he's such a commanding presence and the new Darth Vader is nothing like that he wants to be he wishes he was but he's nothing like that I think that's very interesting I think that that is an extremely interesting place to start the new Darth Vader and I, I definitely think you know that's you know that's JJ Abrams he starts something interesting and this movie does interesting things with it. it develops Kylo's character further but yeah I wanted to get back let's see yeah I, I I'm not 100% certain if I did a good enough job expressing in my video on episode 7 one of my big problems with the movie was all these coincidences ended up meaning that the good guys won fairly easily many many times and so it felt like the conflict in the movie was something that the movie wanted to imply there was but it didn't really deliver and this isn't a problem in episodes 4 through 6 and it's not really a problem here either I really like for a huge chunk of this movie I was like there's no way they're gonna they're gonna lose the good guys are gonna lose which is also you know like the Empire Strikes Back there is like I mean Han and Leia literally spend the entire movie fleeing you know trying to get away from the bad guys not fighting them which is that you know that's the thing like episode 7 there are a couple of times where they're fleeing you know when when Ray and Finn get to the uh, the Falcon and fly off they're they're running but like the, it's it's way too easy for them to to fight back at Maz Kanata's castle when when they're on Starkiller base which is also way too easy for them to get to and just yeah now I I heard a number of people say that some of the action scenes you know in, in this movie will go from seeming like the heroes couldn't possibly get out of the situation they're in to them just suddenly being out of the situation without any proper explanation I'm not gonna go into spoilers in this part of the video I suppose I don't think I really ever felt that I, I know one specific example that people like specified and I watched the movie and I was like, "What are you talking about?" That we we see very clearly how they how they got out. But I'll I'll talk about that in the in the spoiler section. Right. Another thing about spoilers. If I decide I want to spoil either this movie before the thought section or any other movie, you know, any movie other than the Star Wars movies that came out before this one, I will verbally warn before I do so, and I'll hold up an index finger while I spoil so if you don't want to hear the spoiler you can just mute and skip ahead and she's just me lower my index finger now some people criticize right so, uh... right yeah the the yeah some of the people who criticize this movie I guess they don't think there are enough actual problems that they could criticize about the movie because every every so often they'll say stuff like why doesn't the movie explain this when Star Wars right from the start has not explained everything that's part of the appeal like Star the a new hope came out when like when there were sci-fi movies that over explained everything that thought we needed to understand every single little thing and a new hope comes out 
and it's just no this isn't earth yeah sure they look human but this isn't earth there's a bunch of aliens about and that like it, it used to be that a sci-fi movie, you know, uh, one, one of the human heroes would encounter a robot or an alien or a giant tarantula or something. And he'd be like, what's that? And we'd get an explanation for why is there an alien or a robot or whatever. And just, you know, by 1977, people were, people didn't need that anymore. Like, sometimes you just want a good, you know... An, an experience where you see something that you don't know, you know, just as long as it, you know, I, when Star Wars is at its best, it strikes a good balance between not really explaining things and having things that, like, you can kind of intuit, you know, you get a, like, they, there's not a Star Wars movie where they just say, okay, these are all the things. Here's a list of what the Force can do. It's just kind of, you know, you see, like, most of the time when someone uses the Force in a new way, there's not, like, a person saying, oh, they're using the Force to do... No, it's just, you get, oh, you know, they, they concentrate and then they can do something. Like, you know, the first time we see telekinesis used by... Uh, excellent. Hmm. No, yeah, yeah, the, I, yeah, I, I should move on. According to IMDb trivia, Carrie Fisher was also a well-known, Carrie Fisher, RIP, was also a very well-known writer whose services were often called upon to act as script doctor for other films. She later began, began declining such assignments when producers would solicit her story ideas, then hire someone else to actually change the script and use Fisher's ideas without paying her. However, director Ryan Johnson revealed that Fisher helped with the writing of the script for this film. Although Disney decided not to use George Lucas' story outlines for episodes 7, 8, and 9 after the purchase of his company, a couple of Lucas ide Lucas' ideas resurfaced in this film, including Luke Skywalker living as a recluse and training a female Jedi. In Lucas' Lucas's outline, her name was Kira. And, yeah, so, quoting some fellow critics, So much happens in the movie that you may need more than one viewing because there is a lot of setup that you might not be able to pick up on the first time that helps explain stuff that happens later. Some people say that it's a problem the movie focuses too much on fuel, but problems with spaceships have always been part of Star Wars. Just because spaceship fuel hasn't been mentioned before does not mean that it did not exist, just that it was not a problem. And yeah, and and some critics say that you know for ex stuff like the the first order being so strong in in this movie, you know, compared to, to episode seven, it seems like this difference is purely because Ryan Johnson wanted it to be this way so that it would work better for his movie and. I, there are definitely some, some discrepancies. I guess if I thought that episode 7 was a better movie, maybe it would bother me more. But there's definitely, for, for sure, I'm, I'm not going to claim that this movie is completely consistent with what was set up in episode 7. I think at the end of the day, you are allowed to do that. As you know, I mean, it's not like he wrestled control out of the producers. The producers let you know they they let Ryan Johnson have this much influence, you know, control over the final product. As long like I would I would have a problem with it if they were like you know forcing the the producers to you know, but the producers allowed it and. I would say it made for a better movie. I, I don't think that the things that... The things that Episode 7 set up, that this undoes or goes in a different direction with, I think this movie does the more interesting thing. I... I'm, I'm really glad that, that Ryan Johnson did not feel that he had to desperately try to make everything in his movie follow 
episode seven. But I, I one hundred percent understand people were frustrated. A lot of people were like, "This is the first time I've been passionate about a new Star Wars movie for decades." You know, so I, I get being frustrated one hundred percent. Now, I've seen some, yeah, some critics say that the script puts the visual aspects before the story. I think I can kind of see what they mean, but I don't I don't really agree. And some say style over substance, I definitely don't agree. And yeah, one critic said Ryan Johnson writes everything in the moment. I I see what they mean. There's, there's some truth to that. I think that's well. Yeah. Now, J.J. Abrams is a mainstream Hollywood director, and he is really fixated on the whole mystery box thing. You know, on, on Lost, for example, he's constantly starting mysteries, and he, you know, only later does he worry about answering them. And, you know, frequently it was other people who ended up having to answer them. But Ryan Johnson, being an independent director, he focuses more on theme than story. He's not very interested in mysteries. You know, unlike J.J. Abrams, he has not written a ton of TV episodes with mysteries. And, yeah. I also, I, I don't think I ended up copying that into this, my, my notes here, but Ryan Johnson was offered episode 7, and the amount of time they gave him, they were willing to give him, he said, that's not enough time. I wouldn't be able to deliver a good movie in that amount of time. And then J.J. Abrams comes in and says, I'll make a movie within that amount of time. And yeah, I, I think, like, apparently the guy, the first guy who wrote episode seven, the or not, the, not, not George Lucas, but I want to say his name was George Arndt. He said, I need 18 weeks in order to make sure that this script is is perfect, and the and Disney was like, no, we're not going to give you that much time. And in comes JJ and I want to say Lawrence Kasdan as well. And in six weeks, they hammered out the final script. And I I wouldn't say that uh, episode seven it's not a bad script as such, but it definitely could be more interesting. And yeah, I've honestly. I would have loved for for Ryan Johnson to write and direct this entire sequel trilogy. I think I that would have been really incredible. But anyway, you know he made he did the best he could, having to follow up like JJ. Let's be honest, JJ started way too many story threads in Episode Seven. There's like some of it, like Ryan John. You can practically hear Ryan Johnson saying, I, "Look, we got to put this on the back burner. I can't." You know, I, I cannot address absolutely everything, and I think that he chose the. I I, I do think that Finn could perhaps have been better handled, but otherwise, I largely think that he chose the more interesting story and direction for story. Let's see the the but but yeah. That was, you know, the reason Ryan Johnson agreed to do episode 8 was when the, you know, when he signed on to do episode 8, there was enough time for him to, you know, properly, you know, yeah, write everything and, and spend enough time in pre-production. As far as I can tell, this movie is what Ryan Johnson wanted this movie to be. You know, no one, no one tackled him near the finish line and, and changed something. This movie is Ryan Johnson's vision for this movie, and I I have to watch more movies by him, and I, I I really hope that he does get the chance to do more Star Wars. I I honestly I've said this before. I really think that the future of Star Wars, I I don't think it we we should get more like Star Wars episode something movies. I think we should get more spin off stuff. I, you know, I've, I've watched Rogue One, I thought it was much, much better than Episode 7. I've watched the first episode of the first season of The Mandalorian, so much better than Episode 7 of, of you know, 
Yeah, The Force Awakens. And, yeah, I, I really think that's where... It, I, I don't think there's that much more you can do with just, you know, imitating the original trilogy like they did with the sequel trilogy. So, plot twists. I would say the movie does a good job. I, I think there are some that... They're definitely not what you expect, and they're not what a lot of... They're clearly not what a lot of people wanted, but I do think they're more interesting than than just... Yeah, a, a lot of the alternatives. I don't think that there are too few or too many plot twists. So, the... Yeah, the on the direction, Ryan Johnson directed, and he's also yeah. So so yeah, Knives Out two in post production, Knives Out. He did a music video, and then yeah, Looper, The Brother Moon, Brick, and yeah, three. He has three TV credits, four shorts, and two videos. Now, yeah, the, the, you know, he's more of an artistic director than J.J. Abrams. It doesn't have to be a problem when more than one director works on the same overall series, even a trilogy, but you do need to have an overall plan for plot and, and such. A singular vision helps a lot, and this trilogy has neither of those, and yeah, you know, episodes eight and nine are hurt by it. I honestly, I, th I think I, I would love to see what what Ryan Johnson would have come up with for episode seven because this is what he, this movie is what he does with what J.J. Abrams left him, which clearly was not something he wanted to, like. He was not interested in the same story threats as as JJ was, and the the course correction here, like it it reminds me somewhat of the way that X Men: The Days of Future Past followed up on X Men: First Class, and yeah, with both, I think they did an incredible job course correcting. Now, IMDb trivia. After reading the script for the film, Mark Hamill told writer-director Ryan Johnson, I pretty much fundamentally disagree with every choice you've made for this character. Now having said that, I've gotten it off my chest, and my job now is to take what you've created and do my best to realize your vision. Despite the divisive response among audiences, cinema score audiences rated with the same score as The Force Awakens, and more positively than The Rise of Skywalker, while critics gave it a fresh uh, approval aggregate score on both Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic, Hamill later said in a statement that he had maintained respect for Johnson, as well as episode 7 and 9 director J.J. Abrams, although he only follows Ryan Johnson on Twitter. And... Yeah, before I... There's, there's more than I want to get to there, but I just want to briefly say I do really sympathize with Mark Hamill. I'm... I'm he was apparently really excited to return when when he when he heard that they were doing episode seven and that there was a role for Luke Skywalker, uh, yeah, to play in that movie, and yeah, I mean he he didn't get a choice on this movie as far as I understand. He signed a contract to appear in all three movies of the sequel trilogy, and when he read the script for this, it wasn't at all like. Yeah, he hugely disagreed with it, and I I do feel bad for him. That it it really is. I I don't love that you know a situation like that where someone you know he's he's passionate about this character has been for for decades, you know, and then like he doesn't get much of a say in how the characters. Depicted, he gets you know he 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 can like put subtleties into his acting performance, but at the end of the day, like if he tries to perform it in one way and then the director says no, that's not what I want you to do, he has to change it. So I I do really I I really sympathize with with Mark Hamill on the yeah. 
Back time to you, Trivia. Daisy Ridley and John Boyega have both talked about in interviews how their initial reaction after reading the script for the first time was trying to get in contact with Johnson as soon as possible because they couldn't wrap their head around the direction he was going. Boyega later, later said, yeah, later said that his uh, character was treated better on the episode 9 Duel of Fate's unmade script by Colin Trevorrow that J.J. Abrams discarded due to him giving, I suppose, I'm just gonna... Hmm. Yeah, I'm. That's kind of spoiled for this movie. Yeah, Ridley stated Johnson shot what he wrote while Abrams was constantly changing the script. Abrams co-writer Chris Terrio said the Rise of Skywalker script was rewritten every day, and from what I hear, it shows. Lawrence Kasdan initially wrote a story outline for the film, but was called away to work on Force Awakens when problems arose with that film's initial script. When Ryan Johnson signed on as director, he requested to scrap Kasdan's story and write his own script from scratch, to which the producers consented, as Kasdan's outline no longer matched up with the finished storyline of the previous film. It is known that Ryan Johnson's Last Jedi that got made is the closest film to the unmade sequel trilogy drafts by Star Wars franchise creator George Lucas, who vocally complained about The Force Awakens being nothing like his drafts and highly derivative of the original 1977 Star Wars that served the franchise, making very clear it lacked new planets and plots, making clear he wouldn't have made anything like The Force Awakens. Production designer Rick Heinrich said in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter that the original screenplay by writer director Ryan Johnson was so ambitious that it had double the number of sets you might expect on a film like this. The original script had about 160 sets in it, a ridiculous amount of sets. I didn't say that to Ryan because I figured on something this big he'll find that on his own. It's a hundred day shooting schedule, said Heinrichs. So there's more than one set a day you have to prepare for. In the end, the production settled on 125 sets on 14 stages at Pinewood Studios. The truth is we ended up combining things and trying to be smart about how we're going to do it, said Heinrichs. We did do some trimming and cutting. It forced him to actually cut the shoe leather, as they say, and combine things in the script and reduce a number of things that way. I think that might actually also account for some of the, the sloppier writing, which, again, I am not, I'm not claiming that this movie has no sloppy writing. And that is, of course, you know, when, when, I, I don't know if it's Kathleen Kennedy's decision purely, but, you know, the, whoever at Disney really said, you know, let's, let's give an entire Star Wars movie to this more artistic, independent director, they really should have been like, okay, look. There are some things you need to know. There are some things you need to accept before you just... Because he just... He dove in head first. Like, he was like, this. let's go. I am here for this. And some of his ideas, evidently, it was a little bit too ambitious. And that actually, again, like, holy crap. His, his original vision was even more ambitious than what we ended up with. That really is. Yeah. Director Ryan Johnson stated that Star Wars The Last Jedi took inspiration from the film's 12 o'clock high, Letters Never Sent, The Bridge on the River Kwai, which earned Sir Alec Guinness an Academy Award for Best Actor, and Three Outlaw Samurai. I have to admit, the only of those I've watched is The Bridge on the River Kwai, but yeah, for sure, like, this, this thing of, like, an, a World War II movie with like the sensibilities of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You can really tell. It, it really shows. Now, I, I don't know if Three Outlaw Samurai is also a World War II movie, but Letter Never Sent certainly sounds. And I know Bridge Over Kwai is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. It's It's been a little while since I looked at it, so, yeah. Writer-director Ryan Johnson commented about the character of General Hux. I found the character of Hux, I don't know, I immediately found him very funny. I saw a lot of humor potential in him, and I knew that Kylo was going to be front and center as kind of the heavy in this movie. We didn't need another heavy between Kylo and Snoke, and so the notion of Hux being, kind of being this foil that could add a slightly different flavor to everything, I thought could be more useful. I do agree that he's uh, Hux has turned into too much of a joke in this. 
I have a, hmm, I suppose, yeah, I, I have some stuff to say about that that has, it contains spoilers, so one of the next sections. I feel like I'm taking too long on this. I'm going to try to speed through a little more. The opening weekend box office made more than all of the writer-director Ryan Johnson's previous films combined. Many fans and audiences were disappointed by how this film disregarded several plot threads started in Force Awakens, how it answered some of its, and how it answered some of its lingering questions. Ryan Johnson said in interviews he had read J.J.'s script for Force Awakens, but to his knowledge there was never an overarching story outline for the trilogy that he had to adhere to. Lucas Films executives, including Kathleen Kennedy, gave Johnson full creative freedom to develop the stories he saw fit. They were reportedly enthusiastic, enthusiastic about some of his more controversial choices. Right, here it is. Ryan Johnson was originally considered to direct Star Wars, yeah, Episode 7. He declined due to stating he needed more time to ensure the movie would be good enough, but he agreed on Episode 8 because it would give him an extended amount of development time. For its release, The Last Jedi was so well received internally by Lucasfilm, Ryan Johnson was offered an entire Star Wars trilogy to himself. Johnson agreed to do a trilogy, but only on the condition of getting even more development time than he had for The Last Jedi to write and polish his scripts on the side of doing other projects in the meantime. Johnson also wants to do an episode of The Mandalorian as Han and has spoken to Dave Filoni about it. The opening crawl was the very first thing that Ryan Johnson started writing. It was not finalized until the last days of post-production. And, yeah, quoting fellow critics, the, the director and the Jedi is long on time, but has enough sentiments to satisfy. In terms of directing, The Last Jedi shines. In terms of storytelling, it meshes together a lot of elements that have so much potential. Potential is, is left untapped. I don't know if I completely agree with that. Writer, yeah, Ryan Johnson has done a remarkable job making The Last Jedi a film that somehow both stands on its own and fits wonderfully into an ongoing journey. Thanks to its direction, its ecstatic visual, and its ability to create moments of epic intensity, Last Jedi rises as a huge contribution to the legacy of the saga. Ryan Johnson takes some major risks here, some of them work well, while other choices contribute to the film's uneven tone. Wonderfully directed, acted, and progressive film, though it takes place in a galaxy far, far away, the emotions and politics are very much here on Earth today. The story is compelling. There are some good characters to follow on this journey through many twists and turns. The acting is solid. The visual effects are top-notch. This is an impressive effort by Ryan Johnson. The director manages to raise a moving monument to something as brilliant and even as even corny as the possibility of a shared dream. Abrams gave us the gentle reintroduction we needed, and it paved the way for Ryan Johnson to take the story in strange new directions. Upends expectations, demythologizes the mythos, and takes an iconic series in a bold new direction with a story full of human courage and dazzling imagery. With this movie, Ryan Johnson takes the Star Wars saga into uncharted territory with exciting results. With deft direction by Johnson and a script that has its ominous and mythical moments, but never quite feels over the top or silly, this features strong work from Hamill, Ridley, Driver, and Boyega. It just demonstrates an understanding of the Star Wars universe and its appeal while also taking it into wonderful new directions. The Star Wars franchise is in good hands with writer Rich, yeah, with Ryan Johnson, who developed Dolores, an enthralling, often funny, and at times achingly beautiful galactic adventure in The Last Jedi.
It franchise will surprise you with new story possibilities, new emotions, new visuals to feast your eyes on in practically every frame. It conveys how much fun it is to do this stuff. Ran, uh, Ran Johnson took my Star Wars reverence and served them back to me with vast improvements. It goes in bold new directions while delivering familiarity, written and directed with thoughtfulness and visual flair. The Last Jedi deserves nothing but acclaim, and Johnson, an incredibly adept director, deserves to be handed as many future Star Wars films as he can manage. The Last Jedi repeatedly goes against your every instinct, takes your emotions for a roller coaster, and takes the characters we know in directions that will blow your mind. Ryan Johnson has truly delivered the galaxy goods on this event, the second installment of the sequel trilogy. Ryan Johnson's movie has a sense of humor about itself and a sense of joy, but its emotional generosity, even in the midst of all the extravagant green screen work, is its best special effect. Ryan Johnson's Imagination seems boundless as George Lucas's four years ago. The Last Jedi boasts many very good performances, ones that enrich the characters and which salute writer-director Johnson's ability to find the humanity within technology, something he proved early on with his artful time travel thriller Looper. Ryan Johnson has certainly made the busiest Star Wars film of them all, but he keeps it from becoming a slog by infusing it with humor, verb, and visual charm. When everything pulls in the same direction, as it does consistently in this movie, it's like watching a mind-boggling clockwork click, in, click into a deft ballet. The best directed, most beautiful looking Star Wars movie since Empire. The movie made by gifted indie auteur Ryan Johnson nails the balance of novelty and nostalgia in a much more in much more satisfying fashion. He doesn't radically reinvent Star Wars, but he does dig into the impulses and the new trilogy's younger characters, cracking them open and examining their psychology in a way Star Wars rarely has. Johnson is to be lauded for not locking himself into a retelling of the same old story. While there is plenty of familiarity, this franchise basically demands it, he isn't afraid to go in new directions. The miracle of this movie is its rejection of series formality. Johnson manages to honor mythology while also having fun disrupting it. The movie goes big on identity, confusion, and loss as Johnson puts characters through the existential ringer like no Star Wars director before him. It's impressive to see such a long-lived saga still being able to build so many classic moments and memorable twists. The movie breaks everything we know as a trilogy, and that's perfect. You just have no idea of what to expect, because actually everything can happen at any time, and things really do happen. Johnson knows what makes a Star Wars movie and a great sci-fi epic, setting the bars pretty high for this one visually, technically, and narratively. Not just making it a love letter to, for the real fans, but putting it up there with Empire in a kind of surprising manner, while also setting it apart from his older trilogy brother by the inventively courageous plot, the gorgeous presentation, and the mind-blowing twists.
and yeah so the Right. Uh, too many plot points rely on bad communication. When it cuts away from Ray and Luke, we wanted to go back to them. And it subverts expectations, but not just to subvert expectations, but to make Star Wars interesting again. The themes are interesting, but not all of them are get enough development, given enough development. The movie isn't perfect, there are definitely things about it that don't work, but it's not terrible either. This movie made me feel like the director think, think that I'm childish for still loving Star Wars as an adult. I, I understand what he means, but I really don't think that was intentional and I, I didn't feel like that. Now, the, the opening of the movie does a really good job setting up that this is like, you know, they're, they're in, the, the characters are in a lot of danger and it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for, you know, not just to defeat the First Empire, but the First Order, the second empire, but to even survive. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came, I will say it fits with what came before. I'm thrilled with how the movie ends. There is no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. So that brings us to the characters. Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, a powerful Jedi Master who resides on the planet Octo. Turf Nation has made an excellent video about Luke Skywalker in this movie, although note that it does spoil in this movie. According to the critics here, despite the fact that Mark Hamill really hated the way Luke was written, he still gives an incredible performance. And Mark Hamill doesn't necessarily understand the character as well as Ryan Johnson does. Acutely disagreeing with the writing doesn't actually mean the writing is bad. And yeah, I I'm just really briefly gonna say it, I he he really does give an absolutely incredible performance. Like the it's not, I'm not surprised that Mark Hamill is still an excellent actor. You know, I've heard him play the Joker. He's clearly still got it, you know. But it really is, like, he, he, he disagrees with how the character was handled. And he, you know, he thinks that the character is too different from the way he used to be in the original trilogy. And I understand that he doesn't, like his, his performance, it doesn't feel like he's hating what he's doing. And it doesn't feel like he thinks that he's playing a different character than Luke Skywalker. It feels like, you know, I, I would say his performance feels like what I see in the writing. This is Luke Skywalker, but this is, you know, he's he's been through something really terrible, so he's he's changed now and Carrie Fisher RIP as General Leia Organa twin sister Luke former princess of Alderaan and a leading general to the resistance and yeah apparently Yeah, MBB trivia. 
after the break from CGI that was displayed in Rogue One Star Wars Story for recreating long gone actors, the filmmakers of this film saw fit to issue statements ahead of release, shutting down any speculations or worries on the possibility of such a technology being used for the late Carrie Fisher. In short, all her scenes, barring the stunts, are categorically hers, including the dialogue. And she also gives a very good performance. Like, you can really feel the weight of this resistance on her shoulders. Like, she is acutely aware that this, like, she's, if she fails, that's it. The first or you know, who, who even knows if, like, if the First Order becomes another empire, who knows if they'll be able to stop them. You know, they were barely able to stop them the last time, and that was when Luke Skywalker was at his, you know, was, was still very, yeah, he, he was a completely different person back then, and part of the reason he was able to, to win was that his father was Darth Vader, and he was able to, you know, convince him to come back towards the light. Adam Driver as Kylo Ren, Supreme Leader Snoke's disciple, who is strong with the Force, the son of Han Solo and Leia Organa, Luke's nephew. Quoting a fellow critic here, Adam Driver is the best actor in the entire franchise. Seriously. Kylo and Rey affect each other over the course of the movie, trying both of them trying to pull the other to their side. If if absolutely nothing else, even if if you don't think there's anything else, and I do think that there is, I would argue that the the sequel trilogy you know, if not for the sequel trilogy, we would not have Adam Driver playing Kylo Ren. And that really would be criminal. Like, he is unbelievably talented. And just, the, the, this kind of, like, you can, you can sense, like, he's not quite sure, like, he, he, his, his actions and his words say I am devoted to the dark side. I will never, you know, I, I will only ever follow the dark side. But, you know, occasionally he'll he'll have a little trouble pushing through his his clear doubts. And it's it's really really interesting. Like that was the the ultimately the prequel trilogy. You know, we knew that at the end of the day, it's going to have to culminate in Anakin becoming Darth Vader. So it didn't really have this opportunity, but I do think that it's really interesting to have this, like, in, in the original trilogy, Vader fell to the dark side before the events of the movies. And at the very, very end of Episode 6, he swayed back to the light, but... Here we have one who is, like, he's done, like, you know, if you just look at the results he's caused, you know, you'd say, okay, dark side, clearly. But as much as he tries to stay on that path, every so often, you know, he'll, he'll have trouble, you know, he'll, he'll feel the little twinge of, of pull to the, to the light side. And that's really really interesting and and this movie like throughout i was ag again when i sat down to watch it i already knew, i knew how it starts i knew the middle i knew the end but i was still sitting there like is he going to turn like i could i could kind of see it and and that really is uh, like the writing and the acting is so strong Daisy Ridley as Rey, a highly force-sensitive scavenger from the desert planet Jakku, who joined the Resistance and goes to find Luke. 
According to IMDb Trivia, Daisy Ridley took her father to the set in Ireland, where the ending scene of Force Awakens was about to be recreated. When her father met Mark Hamill, he asked him, Who do you play, then? Ridley admitted that she was not sure if her father was joking. I mean, that is a really... If, if he is joking, that's, that is a... That is a really great... Like, and it's such a dad joke, too. Wow. Anyway, and according to special features on Disney+, Plus, it was very important for Ryan Johnson to explore the relationship between Kylo and Rey. And his, he said that his favorite bad guys are the ones that you can identify with. And that's why Kylo was the character he most look forward to writing for this movie. Now, I would say, you know, Ray in in episode 7, she gets a strong introduction and then, you know, after that she's a little underdeveloped you know, I thought I thought she was fine as a character. You know, I, I heard a lot of people say that, you know, oh, she gets a lot worse in episodes eight and nine. And I mean I can understand what frustrates them in this one. I I th I thought she was a compelling character in this. I thought that the way that On the one hand, she really wants to, she wants Luke to train her, but she's also not like, she she can tell that there's something wrong, and she wants to find out what it is, and there is that sense that, like, yeah, I, I thought she was really, really interesting. Like, in, in Empire, Luke is is impatient and he can't really believe you know over and over he expresses he can't really believe these you know the you know the the wisdom that Yoda imparts you know he he looks at it and he says that can't possibly be the case and it it would be really boring if that was just Ray also doesn't really no she she's a fangirl we know that uh, you know, episode seven. She's clearly she, she she thinks that Luke is amazing, and you know she she comes to find him, and she's he's very different than what she expected, but she still you know she wants him to train her, and it it is this. I, I really appreciate it that that she is she's not just blindly she she doesn't believe everything he says you know and yeah I, I thought she was interesting and John Boyega plays Finn a former stormtrooper of the first order who defected to the resistance now in my video on episode 7 I end, I actually ended up accidentally not talking about Finn's personality. In the review itself, I didn't because I felt like it was a spoiler. I don't want... I, I, th I think it's best, the first time you watch episode 7, if you don't know that Finn has this... You know, he's, he's joking, he's charming. Just, yeah, you know, he's, he's super charismatic. But yeah, you know, so I didn't talk about it in the movie itself because, I, you know, felt it was a spoiler. And then I forgot to do it in the spoiler section. You know, I'm not the first person to point out it's kind of surprising that he's so charming when, you know, he's basically a child soldier and an orphan. But yeah, I, I don't know. He's, he's just, he's really, really charming. Now, in this movie, I guess it is a little, it, it doesn't get expressed quite as much. I f yeah, I felt like this depiction of him made a lot of sense. And he probably should have been like this in, in Episode 7, but... You know, th at the end of the day, the, the filmmakers are 
worried that you're going to end up not liking these characters. And, you know, they are meant to be these big crowd-pleasing movies. I, I would say that this movie proves that even when you tone it down significantly, you know, he can still really carry your... You know, you still have... He, he still has your full attention. But but yeah, he's 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 really really the 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 characters is compelling. You know, this idea that a stormtrooper could defect is is really interesting and I wish I could say that they I don't think what they give him to do in this movie is bad, but it probably isn't the most interesting that they could have given him. Oscar Isaac plays Poe Dameron, a high-ranking X-Wing fighter pilot in the Resistance, and he's, you know, there's, he's, he's challenged a bit on some of his ideas, and yeah, I, I found it very compelling, Ewan. Andy Serkis as Supreme Leader Snoke, leader of the First Order, Kylo Ren's master, According to the commentary track by Ron Johnson, Andy was on set. He didn't have to be tech-wise, but it helped performances, and it's it's such a good so it's such a good decision. And you can really tell, like, there's a shot where he is like face to face. Like, if I don't know if Snoke has bad breath, but the character right in front of his face definitely knows. And just the the I'm I'm not gonna say who. But that other character, like, the performance of the other actor, you can really tell, okay, yeah, they're face-to-face -face with an actual actor. They're not just looking at, like, a special effect or, like, the, you know, how they'll have, you know, the the two dots that serve as the, the eyes that the, the other actors are supposed to look at because the character is taller than... A, no, like, clearly, the, the... Yeah, it's a... It's a very natural performance, and yeah. Lupita Nyong'o as Maz Kanata, a pirate and an ally of the Resistance. She doesn't get a lot to do, but I'm never, you are never gonna, if, if I, if you ever hear the words come out of my mouth, too much Lupita Nyong'o in a movie, I mean, at that point, you know, I mean, this is the wrong Let's see. You know that someone used a mind trick on me. It's there's there's no way I'd say that of my own free will. And yeah, Donald Gleason as General Hux, the former head of the First Order's Starkiller base. And yeah, some critics say you know there's too much slapstick. He became a joke, and it didn't like. I thought it was gonna bother me a lot in this movie, have, having heard people talk about it, it really didn't bother, like, it bothered me a third of as much as I thought, based on listening to people talk about how bad it was, but it, I, I, I don't love it, I, yeah, I, I get it, I understand how you, you get there, and definitely, like, it would have been absolutely ridiculous if it was Kylo or Snoke that became jokes walking punchlines, but, yeah. And Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, human protocol droid in the service of Leia Organa. Doesn't get a lot to do, but he does have some really good moments in this. Gwendolyn Christie as... Yeah, that technically... Never mind. Kelly Marie Tran as Rose Tico, a member of the Resistance who works in maintenance. And, yeah, so IMDb Trivia says that Kelly Marie Tran, who plays Rose, said in an interview that she was on a press tour in London and stepped by a pub with some friends. A group of people sat at the table next to them, started talking about the movie, which they had just seen, including her character. After she finished eating, she walked over and said she'd overheard their conversation. They apologized and asked if they had spoiled the movie for her. She said not at all and introduced herself. When they finally recognized her, they all freaked out. She laughed, sat with them a while, and posed for photos. Tran said it was an otherworldly experience. That really does sound amazing. Now, 
I am just gonna instead of talking for a really long time about you know even if you've never watched this movie or you know you, you probably heard that Rose Tico is a a widely hated Star Wars character there's a there's a Quora post Quora article why do people hate Rose Tico so much does a really good job explaining why people hate her in this movie both the you know there there are I'll grant there are some reasons why her character you know, her character could definitely be handled a lot better and then there's the the yeah the bad reasons the the yeah so yeah I I direct you to that but yeah, let me let me be 100% clear. It is unacceptable to send the kind of hatred that she got. You know, she was the target of racism, sexism, and uh, like I said earlier in this video, this this series has always been about inclusion right from the start, Star Wars has. John Boyega got death threats. The Jar Jar Binks and Anakin Skywalker actors were, you know, also received a lot of hatred online and just, yeah, I, I the, the, it's really, it's, it's unacceptable behavior. People who behave like that don't deserve any Star Wars. So yeah, first of all, don't, no, no, you know, it is unacceptable to send racist, sexist, and other kind of xenophobic hatred towards anyone, period. And also, she didn't write the character, so she doesn't deserve hatred at all. She, you know, she performed the character the way she was directed to. Like, if you want to hate anyone for her character, hate Ryan Johnson, and maybe also Kathleen Kennedy, although I, no. D don't hate Kathleen Kennedy. There's an absurd amount of hatred towards her. She's clearly doing the best she can. She's... She gave a little too much leeway to, to JJ and Ryan Johnson, but you know, she's also made some really good decisions for this. If if she was as incompetent as a lot of people claim, Star Wars would be in considerably worse condition. Now, let's see. Like I would say that the the some of the DCEU some of the decisions made there much much worse like they they were really on track to completely just like me like if Snyder had continued to get to do exactly what he wanted like the the I, I think there's some chance that the DCU would pretty much have just failed when the the first Justice League movie came out now the let's see. yeah so Laura Dern plays Vice Admiral Holdo an officer in the resistance a lot of people hate her character I don't think the character is particularly bad I think just a lot of people couldn't really handle that like there are some things about her that are very different from what you expect and I, I would say by, by the time you've watched the entire movie, you have a really good understanding of her character. And it seems to me like some people kind of didn't accept some of the things they were told about her character. They kind of, they, they thought they knew her character and they judged the character based on that. And then they didn't reassess their judgment when new information was, anyway. Benicio Del Toro as DJ and... Yeah, he, I, Benicio Del Toro is someone else, like, I'm never, 
he's, he's always amazing. And apparently Joaquin Phoenix turned down that role. I could definitely see him in... It's, it's difficult to say... I mean, they're both really good at creating kind of weird, odd characters, so, yeah. Uh, I suppose that's good. Yeah, so. Junas Suatomo appears as Chewbacca, taking over the role from Peter Mayhew, RIP. After previously serving as his body double in episode 7, Mayhew, who, who suffered from chronic knee and back pain, was credited as Chewbacca consultant, which is, is kind of cute. And yeah, there are various. Yeah, I'm just gonna. There, there's some really cool cameos. Justin Thoreau, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Warwick Davis, Rogue One director Gareth Edwards, Edgar Wright and Joey Cornish, Joe, sorry, Joe Cornish, Cameo, and right, and yeah, Mark Hamill's children, Griffin, Nathan, and Chelsea, Cameo as Resistance Soldiers, And Princess William, Hare and Harry, came out as stormtroopers. Right, Tom Hardy has an appearance as a stormtrooper. Uh, his cameo was dropped from the final cut. Yeah. One critic said that every major character in this movie has an arc or experience a big revelation. And that's absolutely true, and that is exactly as it should be. Like that's, if they they really did an an incredible job in in this. I'm not going to say everything about the characters was well handled, but every major character has something interesting going on. And a critic said that this has the best acting out of any Star Wars movie. And, I mean, I haven't watched Solo and Rise of Skywalker yet, so I can't, say, you know, the, the, I should specify, that critic said that after those two movies came out, so they really have watched all of them. I can imagine, though, I could absolutely imagine that this is the best. I think the characters in Episode 7 largely lacked defin definition and depth. Several of them had interesting starting points, but ultimately really didn't get enough development in that movie. In some ways, this movie does do a better job at that. Episode 7 has too many characters, too many major good guy characters, too many antagonists. It seems like this one has the same problem. Does it at least do a better job? Making sure everyone has an important part to play. I yeah, I would definitely say ev everyone in this has an important part to play. And I, th you know, at the end of the day, I think some of these characters again, like I, I think there was probably a contract saying, you know, even if some of these characters, if if you don't care about all of them, you know, they have to be in here. So. And and you can kind of tell some some of the time, you can tell. Okay, this is not a character that Ryan Johnson really wants to be dealing with. Now, diversity in casting is one thing. Not all not all movies with diverse casting casting does actually understand the unique perspectives of its minority characters. I would definitely say that 
Rose Tico is a character that, you know, I've, apparently, like, I haven't read absolutely everything there is, but the, I've heard that once Rose Tico was criticized by a number of, of fans, you know, Kathleen Kennedy and Rand Johnson both said all of the criticism is racist and sexist. And there's definitely a lot of that, but there, there is, you can actually criticize the character without that. And it kind of seemed like they weren't willing to, you know, engage with that criticism. And, you know, that is frustrating. But yeah, the, the character, like, it is, her character has a, a very specific point of view, and the movie really does, yeah, there's, there's a lot of empathy there. The movie has a lot of empathy for her character, and again, like, the, you know, I've, I've read a bunch of, of things and listened to part of a podcast where you know, people with people who didn't get to see themselves in big blockbusters very often, you know, they really they they saw themselves in her. And I don't think that it is tokenism with, with her at the very least. And the I suppose, yeah, that's what I will say about that. So the cinematography was handled by Steve Yedlin, and he has, let's see, is it... As far as I can tell, he didn't... Oh, no, never mind. There it is. He has apparently DP'd every movie that Ryan Johnson has directed. And, yeah, I completely understand why. I also want to... I, I definitely want to see more stuff that he DP'd. Because he really did an incredible job here. And yeah, he's he's DP'd a bunch of other stuff as well. Not sure how much of it is particularly relevant here. Oh, that's right. He he was director of photography on May. I think that's the only other movie. Yeah, this and May are the two movies that he's DP'd that I've watched. And apparently Ryan Johnson, I, I forget exactly what, I think maybe editorial department or something, but he apparently also worked on that. Now, the movie, the, the cinematography keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. And the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. So, yeah, quoting fellow critics here, gorgeous cinematography, time and again, Johnson finds a cinema cinematic grammar that feels new to Star Wars. Big close-ups, tender touching hands, top shots, elegant camera tracks, and pulling out in-world sound, leaving just music and image. And the editing was handled by Bob Duxay, if that's how you pronounce that. And, let's see, yeah, he's edited other, let's see, he, okay, so he hasn't edited everything that Ryan Johnson has directed, but he did also edit Looper and Knives Out, so, yeah. And yeah, the editing also does a good job keeping it easy to follow fast-moving scenes. 
it keeps more calm than that is called for. Ultimately, I would say there are there there is stuff in this movie that should have been cut, and trimmed down at least. And okay, so yeah, quoting for the critics. Ryan Johnson's original cut of the film exceeded three hours, reports saying he cut between 45 and 60 minutes to get the film down to a more palatable runtime. Several of the deleted scenes can be seen on the Blu-ray edition of the film, most of them alternate or extended versions of scenes that remain in the movie. And... The movie is too long and some scenes, such as the Ray ones, aren't given time to breathe. Yeah, that is that is true. This has some absolutely incredible special effects. Some really strong stunts. Right, so effects. I have never been a fan of the cute aliens in Star Wars, and I completely understand why people hate the cute ones in in this movie I don't like them either but I do think it is silly that you know there, there are people who act like before episode 8 there were no cute aliens in Star Wars there were always cute aliens and robots in Star Wars personally I would say that the Ewoks are much much worse than I would say they're called Porgs in this movie. And the ones from the prequel movies are also much, much worse, in my opinion. We don't have to agree on it, but if you're one of the people who say that this is the first time that there were cute aliens and or robots in Star Wars, look at the other movies again. I'll grant that Chewbacca is cool a lot of the time, but there are other times where we're clearly supposed to think he's cute. A lot of the time, R2-D2 seems cute. I guess C-3PO isn't necessarily cute, but he is there in part to appeal to children and, you know, the... What's it called? The inner child. And, yeah, I th think that probably covers episodes 4 and 5. I suppose there are probably people who think that the Jawas are, are cute. Although I know at least one kid who... Well, well, he's not a kid anymore, but when he was a kid, he thought they were terrifying because they hurt R2-D2. And that's a fair point. But yeah, episode 6 has Ewoks. Episode 1 has Gungans. You cannot tell me that Porgs are worse than, worse than Gungans. Episode 2 has some of the most aggressive C-3PO slapstick. Episode 3, you know, some of the stuff with R2-D2, him fighting battle droids and super battle droids, is definitely there to appeal to children. In Episode 8, we have BB-8. Episode 7, we have BB-8. Like, And I do think also, you know, apparently, according to, I mean, Syria, according to Ryan Johnson, the porgs were the result of puffins being native to Skellig Michael, the island where the Octo scenes were filmed. They were unable to move them, as they are a protected species, and it would have been too time-consuming and expensive to edit them out of the shots, so Ryan decided to create a new indigenous species and simply CGI over the puffins. I do agree that they're in too much of the movie, and they definitely, like, they're in scenes that aren't on Octo, so they're, like, they, they're in... They're in parts of the movie that they don't need to be in at all, and I do wish that they had, but it's on brand, you know. It's not my favorite part of Star Wars, but, like, if I watched, come to think of it, I guess, is there anything cute in Rogue One? I mean, I feel like... K2SO is a bit too snarky to really qualify as cute. You know what? That one might be it might actually be an exception. But but you know, yeah, other than that, you know, Star Wars movies have cute aliens and or robots. That's just yeah. 
the budget was somewhere between 200 and 317 million, according to IMDb, uh, or Wikipedia, rather. So, filming locations. In order to get the 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 settings that this wanted. This was shot in Bolivia, Croatia, Ireland. Let's see, uh, California, New York. Various back lots. Yeah. And it was filmed between, what does that say, 15th of February 2016 and 22nd of July 2016. And, yeah, quoting fellow critics, there's a greater variety of new planets than Episode 7, which tended to use ones that were mirrors of the ones in A New Hope. I agree, like, this really, I guess... This is probably the best overall Star Wars movie in terms of having really different, like, settings. Although Rogue One did also do a quite good job. Hmm. Yeah, I'd, I guess this is maybe tied with Rogue One. Now, some people say the casino planet just looks like a casino here on Earth, way too much. There's nothing Star Wars about it, and the rich people look like they belong in the capital in the Hunger Games movies. I wouldn't say that there's nothing Star Wars about it. I, I don't know, I, f I feel like that's people who don't like the casino scenes who are kind of just trying to find something to criticize it for. I get not liking the casino scenes. I... I thought they were fine. I like that, like, they have some... They have something to say, which, again, Star Wars has always had. You know, I, I think Star Wars is kind of boring when it doesn't have anything to say, when it's... Just, yeah. But the... The, the rich people do look like they walk right out of the capital in, in Hunger Games, for, for sure. But some of them are very alien looking, though. There's, there's one alien... I don't know the story. I don't know why they don't have a head, but they don't. So instead, they have this little hollow pad on the top of... sitting on the top of their neck, and that projects a head. I've never seen that in a Star Wars movie before. And I don't think you have either, because I'm pretty sure we've watched the same ones. So, I, that's pretty cool, and that's not something that you would get in Hunger Games. And, like, there was this other one... Yeah, I, I would definitely say there's enough Star Wars about the casino... Like, if you showed it to someone who didn't know anything about this movie, you just showed them clips of that, and you didn't tell them it was Star Wars, they would still be able to tell that's that's Star Wars. There's, yeah, there's enough the there's enough of robots and holograms and, and aliens, and they have that unique Star Wars feel to them. Again, like, if, if you're, you're allowed to disagree, but just... Think about if you really do believe that the casino doesn't look like it belongs in Star Wars, or it, if it's just that you don't like that there is, you know, there, there's something about it you don't like, and and because of that you you say that you know just you're you're completely allowed to say it, but it makes your argument weaker if you you know if you, if your arguments are bad, people are less likely to take your opinion seriously when you criticize something, and, yeah, it, it just, it doesn't seem like a particularly solid criticism to me. Now, the action is great. This is some of the best Star Wars action 
you know, you've got chases on foot in vehicles, physical fights, you know, lightsaber action, use of force powers and equipment and vehicles that really tremendously expand on what you can do. And I, uh, I don't want to give away exactly which one. I'll, yeah, I'll just say, the com in the commentary, Ryan Johnson talks about that there is a major fight scene where the actors got the choreography down so well that he could keep the camera at a distance. He didn't have to use close-ups or shaky cam and or shaky cam to hide the the and and it shows you know i i heard that you know when i listened to the commentary track i wasn't you know i i used to watch the movie very carefully when i was listening to a commentary track but i don't know i i get kind of burned out if i watch the same movie too many times now so i just i listened to it and like maybe occasionally i would glance over i knew which scene he was talking about but i didn't watch that scene carefully until i watched the movie and it shows, like, and it is, it is a much better scene for it. So yeah, in, in my opinion, in Episode 7, once you've watched a number of action scenes, you realize that Stormtroopers, TIE Fighters, and others for the good guys to fight will appear and disappear as needed. And if the good guys are supposed to flee, there's too many fight. If they're supposed to win, there's enough to defeat. You know, right outside Maz Kanata, it goes from the good guys being on the run or wait, of being able to gun down every stormtrooper that tried to shoot them, to there being too many of them to fight, and suddenly they're taking prisoners? Because if not, then they wouldn't survive, and the X-Wings wouldn't have anyone to shoot or rescue. And, yeah, I it to me, it, it really bugs me about Episode 7. It was probably, if I had to point to one thing that bugged me personally, that took me out of the movie, that would be it. And it's, it's not a problem in this one, like, all throughout this one, in every action scene, I felt what the movie wanted me to feel. Like, I felt like, okay, this is hopeless. I felt like, oh, wow, they're going to win. You know, yeah. I guess, yeah, if I had to be brutally honest, there's probably at least a couple of times in this movie where, you know, an action scene plays out the way it does because the screen, the screenwriter needs things to go a certain way. I guess what I'll say is the movie did a good job of disguising that. Like I, I realize it now, having watched the movie, having watched the entire movie, I'm no longer like carefully and and that's the thing, you know, episode seven, I realized I while watching the movie, I realized that the action didn't it didn't completely transport me and in fact I really I yeah I could tell Oops. the the antagonists of this movie are very compelling and their relationship with the protagonists and other major characters are also very compelling I can't really expand on that right now without spoiling anything, so I'll just move on. So, the score is once again handled by John Williams. You know, the, the only Star Wars movie out as I watched, as I recorded this video that he didn't do music for was Solo. And, yeah, you know, his... his he always really delivers a, a great soundtrack. Now, right, so this is from Wikipedia. Kennedy, in July 2013, Kennedy confirmed at the Star Wars Celebration Europe that John Williams would return to score the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Williams confirmed his assignment for The, Jedi, the Last Jedi at a Tanglewood concert in August 2016, stating... He would begin recording the score off and on, December 2016 until March or April 2017. And in, in lieu of a traditional spotting session, Johnson Williams was provided a temp track of music from his previous film scores, 
as reference for scoring at Last Jedi. And yeah, it you know he always delivers. It's it's a it's another great Star Wars soundtrack. Really, you know, get really gets you pumped during the highs. Really gets you, you know, emotional during the the lows. Just yeah. So the yeah the tone is is at times let's go with it's uneven and I would definitely say that parts of that is that Ryan Johnson wanted to make a movie that challenged the audience and you know Lucas Arts basically Lucas Film Lucas Arts is for the games Lucas Film demanded that he fit in certain things because it's a Star Wars movie and they want to make money off it. And yeah, you know, again, like at the end of the day, they should basically have sat down and hashed out, okay, how far are we willing to, you know, how, how far can we go in one direction? How far can we go in the other direction? And yeah, it, it really... I, I hope that he gets to make more Star Wars and I hope that when that happens, the he sits down with the producers, and they reach some some kind of consensus on you know how far to go in this yeah. So pacing. I've seen some say that this has bad pacing and. I do, like, for sure, there are some things in the movie that don't get, you know, some, some things that, that there's just not enough, not enough time is given to, to the thing to, to fully make it completely work, but, yeah. Personally, like, I really enjoyed Act 1, for Acts, and two, for acts 2 and 3. I was completely glued to the screen. You know, I've, I've already mentioned, you know, episode 7, I was fairly interested for the first act, but lost interest for the film for acts 2 and 3 because it didn't do enough new things. It didn't... I, I felt like I could see what was gonna happen, more or less. You know, not saying it did no new things, but it didn't do enough. And while I stand by, the, the similarities are largely superficial, there's enough differences that it's not a complete retread. After a while, I really felt like there's no sense of danger. This is, you know, it's episode four again. Everything that happened, it's, you know, like I, I never thought that, like, let's see, I, I knew that they were gonna end up going to to Star Killer Base. I knew that. There was going to be a bombing run on it. I knew that, you know, I, I didn't know exactly which character it was going to be, but I knew that there would have to be a major character caught and put in Starkiller base for, you know, Han, Chewie, and another major character to go in and free you know, that's also, I mean, I guess I couldn't necessarily, I couldn't have said if it was going to be Finn or Poe, or even Ray before I knew that she was the one to get caught, but, yeah, like, you know, it was that again, it, it, it did that exact thing, you know, it, it's nice that it subverted expectations by there being two captives, and the person who was caught at the very start is actually free very, like, just a few minutes after being caught. But at the end of the day, it's still like every single thing that you know that that a new hope delivered, like there was a variation of it, maybe not the exact same thing, but yeah, some variation of it would happen in in episode seven. and like, I'll grant that some of the action in this movie and and other things in general, you know, there are definitely things about this movie 
that are very similar to Empire Strikes Back, but there's just this sense, like, I mean, right off the bat, the fact that where Han and Leia were fleeing and hoping they wouldn't be, be found, you know, I mean, in this, essentially the First Order are engaged, like, it's, it's essentially a chase scene, you know, I've, I've heard some say, oh, it's like a slow motion car chase, and yeah, that's, that's a decent way to put it. That is just, like, that is automatically, it, there's more of a sense of danger, and again, I'm not saying that Empire made a mistake there, Empire wanted to do something different, you know, and I'm, I think a lot of what Empire does set out to do, I think, was the right call. But it's just, it's such a, if, if episode 7 had done to episode 4, as this does to episode 5, just raising the stakes all the way, instead of just doing something so similar, I would have, I would have had way more respect for episode 7. I enjoyed watching it, but it's not really, it's not a movie I need to watch again anytime soon, and, like... Honestly, if I didn't know that episode 8 was going to be, like, from what I heard, I knew it was going to be more of my kind of thing. Episode 7, like, yeah, I, I, I would have had a hard time getting through it. It would have been a real slog. You know, as it was, I could just be like, well, it'll be better next time. You know, I, I'll, I'll pay close attention to these characters because next time it's going to be much more interesting for me. Anyway, the, the, yeah, yeah, oh, episode five, in, in that movie, you know, Yoda is reluctant to train Luke, and he says, you know, oh, he's too impatient. In this, Luke's, like, he tells Rey, something terrible is going to happen. I'm, I'm not going to get more specific than that in, before I get into spoilers, but he says, something terrible is going to happen. And, and it's just, like, you know what I'm thinking about, actually, yeah, yeah, Yoda did, thinking about it, ah, now, I'm struggling to recall who exactly was it that thought that Luke might become, might join Vader, become like Vader, was it just Luke himself because of the cave? I, I guess the what what Yoda and Ben told him was that he wasn't ready and that his friends would would die if he left. Yeah, so I can't. Okay, I can't say, say it without spoilers. I yeah. Okay, so. Spoilers for this movie. Big spoilers for this movie. Until you see me lower, until you see me lower my index finger. Luke basically says that he thinks that Ray is going to be the next. You know, like he was worried that Ben Solo was going to become the next Darth Vader, and now he's basically worried that of of that same thing with with Ray. And he was kind of right last time. Like, he thought, oh no, this guy is going to become like Darth Vader. And then he did. And now he's like, oh no, you're going to become the next really dangerous. Like, I love episode five, but I'm not sure that it ever completely sold me on the idea that Luke would legitimately become evil. I, I'm not sure. Episode six did more to... to But, but this one, like, it really was, like, holy crap, is, is Ray going to end up evil? Like, that's, yeah, yeah, I, anyway, no more spoilers for the time being, just, yeah, it, it's, it, it takes what it, you know, it's, it's a soft reboot of the, of the, you know, the, the episode that it's 
ah, what's it called? The episode of, of the original trilogy that it corresponds to, but it actually does do, you know, like, I've, I've felt way stronger sense of hopelessness in this than in Empire. And, yeah, you know, comparatively, like, at the end of the day, you know, a new hope, yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're a little hopeful and things are going in the right direction. Yeah, episode 7 doesn't do that much to, like, go beyond that. To, to really ratchet it up to, to another level the way this does. Now. Right, the, it's, yeah, so uh, I, I was saying there's no sense of danger that anything bad is ever going to happen to the good guys. I'll actually grant some bad things do happen to them, but it just didn't hit me. To miss to me, this movie was much better. Now, the movie without end credits, it's two hours and twenty-three and a half minutes, and with them it is two hours and thirty-two minutes. I will grant that is at least a little bit too long. I, I don't know, it would have been difficult to trim it down much more without like losing really important things but yeah yeah it's it's um you you can already tell that it's been trimmed down i would definitely say it's worth the investment of time you know if you're not interested yeah, I maybe 30 minutes in or so. If you're not interested, you know, you you might as well stop watching. It's not the rest of it isn't going to be for you either. I know that some people feel that you know to some people the movie feels much longer than it is. Me personally, I would say it it felt significantly shorter. Like if if I didn't know. I would probably have thought it was 20 or 30 minutes shorter than it actually is. It really, like, flew right by, and not, not like, so fast that I couldn't process everything. But then, you know, I haven't watched... If, if I watched the movie when it originally came out, I might have thought it moved too fast. I, That's definitely a, a, a chance. This is the part of the video where I'm supposed to choose the worst aspect of this movie. I mean, if I point to a thing and I say that's the worst thing, that implies that I think that that thing is bad. I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I guess if I had to pick something, there are definitely aspects, yeah, there are things that Episode 7 set up that this one just kind of just, you know, it either like hand waves away, you know, or it, or it maybe gives a very different follow through or answer. To something yeah I you know if, if you if you loved episode 7 and you watch this there's definitely gonna be things that really you know you can really tell if you know right Ryan Johnson didn't want to be dealing with those particular things and the uh, he didn't want to deal with those particular things So he, he didn't, you know, it's it's not his best work. I don't personally think it's a huge deal, but then, you know, maybe if I loved episode 7, I probably would. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, if you love episode 7, you, if you hate that about episode 8, yeah, I, you, you're right. 
the thing I was most worried about was that the movie was going to get completely out of control because of the, you know, again, like, when you listen to people talk, about, like, you would think that this movie was, like, Dark Phoenix or, like, just, you know, Last, yeah, X-Men The Last Stand, what, you know, one of these just movies that are really that ha that have significant problems with the the writing and the plotting like i'm not saying you know there's definitely some problems with this movie but it's nowhere near as bad as some people make it sound i think for some people it's the fact it's not the f it's not that this is the worst movie they've ever seen it's that it's the worst movie that they've ever cared a lot about like they don't they don't care when these other things have bad movies in a series you know but Star Wars they're passionate about and this you know to them this is the worst Star Wars has ever been and so you know and it's personal to them they've cared about Star Wars since they were children so but yeah the movie exceeded my expectations it was much much better than some yeah the thing I was most looking forward to was a very progressive movie you know a very progressive a Star Wars movie that wore its progressiveness on its sleeve as you know I, apparently some people feel like it isn't obvious enough that the original trilogy is, is progressive and the movie exceeded my expectations. The trailers do give away too much, as modern trailers are wont to do, but they also give a pretty give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. And the cover and posters also give at least a little bit too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And yeah, so on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 91% based on 482 reviews, but only 42% audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. The critics' consensus is Star Wars The Last Jedi honors the saga's rich legacy while adding some surprising twists and delivering all the emotional rich action fans could hope for. Of the 482 reviews, only 45 of them are rotten. And the average rating is 8.10 out of 10. That is certified fresh, which... Is, it's not the only blockbuster to get that. But there are certainly a lot of blockbusters who are nowhere near that. And the average user rating is 2.6 out of 5. And on IMDb, it has a 6.9 out of 10. There are 7,017 IMDb user reviews. And the top 100 are all negative. I, I mean that. I literally I went through all 100 of them are negative. And... There's also a lot of fat phobia and racism because for some reason IMDb doesn't, you know, delete those. I just I feel like that would be a good that'd be a good solution. Just delete the ones that yeah. And there are 725 links in the IMDb external reviews section, and I ran out of time to get into particularly many of them. Now, 595,630 IMDb users voted on this, and 20.1% gave it an 8, 21.3 gave it a 7, 12.7 a 6, 11.4 a 9, 10.4 a 10, and the rest of them are such small 
7.1%. 42,000 people gave to one. That is, wow. And let's see, so that brings us. Yeah, so I probably don't have to tell you at this point. I consider this capital C cinema, not cinematic junk food. And right, I want to briefly compare, uh, compare, recommend a few videos, a brief list of YouTubers who have made excellent videos on this movie that I recommend you watch. Jenny Nicholson, The Closer Look, though, no, I don't agree with everything he says. Turf Nation, his video, Why the Internet Hates Brie Larson, helps explain why some people hate woke celebrities and casting. Pop Culture Detective. And, right, I... Yeah, I'm just really briefly... Okay, so... Spoiler for the yeah for for this movie in one pop culture detective video he points out some tropes in action movies and such pointing out some of the things that work out in a number of action movies like the heroic sacrifice and such i forget who but i saw someone respond basically saying well yeah but the heroic sacrifice worked it worked because it was written to work that's the pop culture detective's entire point. It was written to work out, so people expect it to work out in other films. That's how tropes work. And, you know, these... They acted like they were discussing a historic event where a specific tactic working out would obviously be an actual example of it working out, rather than just an example of it mean, having been written to work out. And more spoilers for the time being. And actually, I I believe I have some recommendations in other parts of this video, but there are some spoilers. That's why I didn't put them there. Now, if you don't already have if you don't already have Disney Plus, it has every Star Wars movie, almost all of the shows, at least in some countries. So, yeah, if you're if you want to watch Star Wars, it's a really good way to have access to all of it and on Disney Plus this movie has 49 minutes of deleted scenes really about 24 and a half but they're there once without commentary and once with commentary and they're see. actually you know a lot of the Star Wars films have deleted scenes on Disney Plus this is the first one where they have commentary he has stuff to say no one it's, it's no wonder they include that. It has a 96 minutes behind the scenes. It, it's a good watch, very interesting. And the full length commentary, you know, yeah, Ryan jo by Ryan Johnson, no one else. Very good listen, very interesting. This is, this might be the most. Outside of the original trilogy, I think this might be the one that has the best extras on Disney Plus of the Star Wars movies. Now, my my rating. I've decided that I'm going to... I'm going to start rating some movies. I'm going to give them one rating that is like just brutally honest and then I'm gonna give one rating that is you know this is how I feel about this movie even though you know if I'm being brutally honest yeah yeah if, if I If I'm brutally honest, this, I, I would, I, yeah, this is, this is eight expectations subverted out of ten. 
but if I'm just going by like my experience with the film, how it how it feels to watch and think back on and and you know looking at does the it's in my opinion the strengths of this movie hugely outweigh the the weaknesses, the negatives. Yeah, I I would have to say this is I I I give this ten deeply emotionally resonant and challenging scenes out of ten. So I mentioned earlier ranking all the all the Star Wars movies that I've seen. This is my updated version. Ranking the films from worst to best. Episodes 2, 3, 1, 6, 7, Rogue One, and episodes 4, 5, and 8. This is my absolute favorite Star Wars movie now. I it's I I honestly did not think that I would ever find there would ever be a Star Wars movie that I thought was better than Empire Strikes Back. And and to be sure, I like you know, the there are I understand why people had an easier time accepting Yoda in Empire than Luke in Last Jedi. Anyway, that brings me to the very next section. So, actually, come to think of it, I guess, yeah, yeah. Right, so, the rest of this video is not a review, series of, well, thoughts, some is analysis, some is emphasis, degree, riff tax, and other jokes. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. And the section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of this as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section right after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So, we are now in spoiler territory. Notes taken while watching. I really love that we start immediately building suspense and quickly getting to an action scene. I also really appreciate that we don't start like knee deep in an action scene. Like this is, I you know the opening of episode three, you know we are already in an action scene and. You know, that movie and this one both have, you know, we already, we know who the good guys are, we know who the bad guys are. So this movie could have started that deep into an action scene. I, I really appreciate, you know, from, from right away, okay, they're clearly in a bad situation. They're trying to do the evacuation. And then, you know, out come the, out of, out of light speed come the, the First Order ships and, yeah. Yeah, I am not a fan of Poe making jokes on a call with Hux. The jokes are too goofy, and it makes too much of a joke out of Hux's character. I will say, I kind of believe that he would hold fire just so he could gloat. And it is only at the end that he fully realizes that Poe is making fun of him. Like, he keeps thinking that he's going to get to gloat. I, props to the actor, like, Donald Gleason, like, having to stand there, I can hear you, can you hear me, you know, do, doing the, the, this kind of, because, because, you know, he's basically, he's playing the character very similar to the way he did in episode seven, you know, he's not, like, he's not doing Dark Helmet, you know, it, it would be very easy to go too goofy, and, yeah. It is really compelling to see Paige sacrifice herself to make sure the bombs hit. And I really appreciate that they cut out everyone's voice. We see people shouting, but we don't hear them. Some of it is in slow motion, just really, really effective. 
given we're told that Poe shouldn't have pulled that stunt, I, th I do think it would be good for the movie to explain what alternative there was. I agree with calling out this kind of careless action, you know, but by by Poe, but we were told that the Dreadnought was a fleet killer, so they did need to do something. It was too close when they were evacuating for them to just get away, as, at least as far as I understand. You know, the, the Poe says it's a fleet killer, and Leia never says, yes, but we should have done this. No, but for sure, like, I, I really appreciate the detail that, you know, he pulls off this, this hotshot stunt, and he gets a lot of people killed. And, you know, the, the fact that they ultimately managed to, to, to win, you know, that doesn't mean that it wasn't a Pyrrhic victory. I agree that there's too many jokes dealing with Finn here at the start, but I do think it is very funny that literally the first thing he says when he wakes up is, Ray! And then when he meets Poe, he says, where's Ray? You know, it's just, yeah. I do quite like the cut from Luke saying, where's Han, to Kylo's helmeted head, because that is in fact the answer. That's why Han isn't there, but it's also all that's left of Han, left alive. You know, for a while, Kylo, like, accepts Snoke's insults, but, you know, eventually he, like, stands up and Snoke, like, shoots some lightning, sending him flying, and the Red Guard, the Praetorian Guard, get out their blades, telling us they're ready to fight to defend Snoke. Now, I appreciate getting rid of the helmet. It's practically criminal to cover up a talent like Adam Driver. His face can communicate so much. I am not leaving without you. I like to think that that's exactly when Luke decided that he was going to drink the breast milk right in front of her. I've seen some question why there would be a place that was strong with the dark side of the Force on the Jedi Island. I don't think it's really that it's a Jedi Island as much as it's an island that's strong with the Force. So there are light places and dark places. Where are you from? Nowhere? You must be from somewhere. I can't teach you. Why not? I've seen your routine. You're not busy. I appreciate she has some attitude with him. She's not just constantly, boringly worship worshipping him. You know, depending on what conservative you ask, Ray is either way too feminine to be a badass, or she wears entirely too little makeup for a girl. With some people, you just can't win. And Kylo attacks in his TIE Destroyer, or whatever it's called. He tries spinning. That's a good trick. Wow, he really is learning from Grandfather. And Kylo has a perfect chance to kill Leia, destroy her ship, and he can't bring himself to do it. And I, I quite like the fact that his momentary... Like, he, he can't bring himself to do it, but someone will. You know, like, it's, like, it's not enough that he himself isn't willing to to go that far you know someone working for the first order will and you can't blow up three ships vice admiral hux becomes vice script dr hux and chewie's about to to chow down on some roasted porg and suddenly becomes acutely aware that he suddenly found himself in one of those you should go vegan things. No, I am not currently taking a stand on veganism. You gotta admit, it looks like one of those, yeah. I like that, you know, R2 plays the, the message for Obi-Wan Kenobi to cajole Luke into training Rey. And he even says, that was a cheap move. I, like, he beat me by one second. I will teach you the ways of the Jedi and why they need to end. Here's a friendly reminder to treat your teacher well. They work hard, and they could end up completely demoralized. 
we are the very last of the resistance. So I guess what you're really saying is, if you can hear this, you are the resistance. That is our mission. And obviously, if any of you find any dinosaurs, you are to let me know immediately. I quite like Holdo talking to Poe about the kind of flyboy he is. I know your type. Don't care for it particularly. I like that Rose talks about how she's been stunning, you know, people abandoning them, and that, you know, she puts away the stun gun, and then she realizes, you know, Finn is running away, and then she stuns him. I quite like Finn and Rose together realizing what they can do to prevent the tracking. Like, we have so many scenes where, in, in movies where one character knows everything and has an exact plan, and, you know, but here it's like they're they're basically figuring out together the bo both of them know some things that you know some some pieces of information that are important in order to form this plan and when they you know they they they'll say something to the other and then the other will realize yeah and yes i do realize that ultimately they don't end up, actually end up accomplishing it but you know, keep in mind the Empire, you know, keeping in mind that Empire Strikes Back is one of my favorite Star Wars movies ever, you know, only slightly below this one still. In that one, they actually also don't accomplish anything. They spend the entire movie running from the Empire only to get caught. All that is accomplished is, like, you know, we've got character development and you've got the, the romance blossoming. I mean, Luke barely learns anything. Like, he's constantly doubting what the, you know, the, the wisdom that Yoda is trying to give out and like disregarding, like he literally said, Yoda tell, you know, what's in that cave? Only what you bring yourself. Your weapons, you will not need them. And Luke keeps the weapons and goes in there like Yoda told him exactly what, like Yoda couldn't have spelled it out anymore, you know, and yeah, and he leaves before the training is through, is through, and without, like, like, despite, like, they're literally saying, stop, you are going to, the, the bad guys are going to win if you leave, and he still leaves, and then he, you know, loses his hand, he gets demoralized from learning that his, you know, Obi-Wan lied to him, his father is actually Darth Vader, You know, it's it's not a pointless movie. The audience learns something, but the good guy characters really don't accomplish much of anything in it. And you know, in this one, like they don't accomplish much, but it's not nothing. You know, by the end of this movie, Snoke is dead. That's way more than you could say for The Empire Strikes Back. You know, again, love that movie. I'm not saying that's a bad movie, but you know, I I, I don't. I'm not sure I'm necessarily saying that that movie should have had something really definitive happen because I think that might have been too much but I'm saying I think it was the right choice for this movie to finish off something that major. So I'm not claiming to have come up with calling it force timing but I don't know. I. I think it's a funny way to put it, so that's what I'm going with. During the force timing between Kylo and Rey, she fires the blaster because he gets, you know, you know, Kylo cannot get too close to one of the good guys in one of these movies without someone shooting him. I, I have to wonder if it's going to happen again in in Rise of Skywalker because, like, you know, I'll, I'll grant it wasn't Rey didn't hit him in uh, Episode Seven. Chewie did, but still, you know, good setup that Kylo says that the strain of projecting across the galaxy would kill Rey, so now, you know, that's what happens to Luke later, and that is, like, the first time you watch it, you're not going to pick up, I, I, you know, I had heard someone else point that out. I don't think they like me. Maybe you should stop calling them creepy slug guy. Seriously, watch Jenny Nicholson. She's great. Incredible. Every word in that sentence was wrong. 
you meant reach all ah wow that my my british accent amazingly failed okay let me try again you meant reach out like yeah um, okay i'm dropping it that's terrible the british have suffered enough you meant reach out like i'll try again he may not be the most gentle teacher but he is one of the funniest I quite like the bit where Ray reaches out and explains what she senses. Like, you know, she, we've been like we've had the Force explained to us a couple of times in this franchise, and and here, like, we get such a good explanation of what it is like when you reach out with the Force, and we also get visuals to go with it. You know, they they really do a great job there. And I like that, you know, after, you know, she, he, she explains all this. And then she turns and says, but I didn't feel you. You've closed yourself off entirely. It's cold. It's calling me. Reject the call. Ghost it. Let it go to voicemail. It offered you something you needed. And you didn't even try to fight. I quite like that... You know the the when when Ray communicates with with I can't believe I'm playing Kylo. You know, and she's like, "You're a monster," and he's like, "Did you tell you why? Did you tell him what happened the night I burnt his temple?" You know, and it is this great and and I really love this as a variation on like it's it's one thing to, you know. You know, obviously, it's go. It's it's a play on the whole. I am your father. You know, Obi Wan lied to you, and when when he told you, you know. This notion that like, Luke, tried to kill Kylo, like, and and you know, Kylo knows. Oh, she likes. She trusts Luke right now. I could tell her, you know, just, and, and that's the thing, like, you know, sometimes, sometimes the truth is horrible. Sometimes the truth is something that you have to fight to get past, or, you know, if, if you're unable to fight to get past it, you'll, you'll succumb to, you know, yeah, you can understand why, you know, Kylo, Kylo saw what he thought was, you know, he was about to murder him. You know, it's really no wonder that that was like, you know, Luke says that he had already, that Snoke already had his allegiance, but I mean, that'll, that'll definitely be, you know, after, after that, there's definitely nothing. So, yeah. It's a terrible place filled with the worst people in the galaxy. And it cuts, and we see she's talking about wealthy people. I really appreciate this criticism of capitalism. Wealthy people ruin infinitely more lives than criminals, other than white collar criminals. An alien assumes that BB 8 must be for gambling and starts putting coins into one of the slots and being like frustrated. Why am I why am I not winning anything? And Rose criticizes the child slavers and arms dealers, and then they're arrested. You know, Finn can't go three scenes without getting electrified by someone so far in this movie. And BB-8 is thrown out because he refuses to give a jackpot. It was too late. What happened? Somebody set up us the bomb. Finn. Episode 7 ran on fumes. I mean, the fleet is. And Finn and Rose aren't quite sure whether or not they can trust DJ. On one hand, Benicio Del Toro is capable, but on the other, you're not sure if you can trust him. Is is really perfect casting. Because really, like, at the end of the day, if hypothetically it had turned out that he was trustworthy, you know, there's still, okay, you can kind of, you know, it's not, like, completely... Like, yeah, I I thought they did a, a really good job there. 
I've seen some people say that if DJ can break out of the cell anytime he wants, why doesn't he, you know, why does he wait until now? But he does need help to escape. He almost got caught, if not for BB-8. The way I see it, he was hoping that Finn and Rose could help him since they sound like they badly need to get out of there. You know, like, hypothetically, maybe he's been in there for days and they've had, like, several other prisoners in there and those prisoners you know maybe they were resigned to their bad situation maybe they like maybe they wanted to escape but when he listened to them it sounded like uh you know if they get into a fight they're gonna give up immediately so i can't you know he was waiting for the best time i'm not gonna make any excuses for the fact that Ch that rose frees the abused animals, but not the child slaves. Given that they have the original Jurassic Park lady, of course they have, they, you know, they had to have the, a nod to the shot of water shaking from the massive footsteps of the T-Rex. Cliff! Which one? Is it Robertson? Does anyone need a lesson in what comes with great power? DJ got ahead of Finn and Rose in the ship. I mean, I guess just because we didn't see him doesn't mean he can't have been flying overhead. And the ship could easily get ahead of those alien horses. And Kylo gives his version of what happened the night that, that he burnt the temple. Some people thought that this was a very accurate account. I believe Luke when he says that it was only for a fleeting moment. The way I see it, Kylo was either lying or he was, like, believing his lizard brain. You know, like, imagine waking up and seeing, you know, Luke Skywalker standing there with a lightsaber. You know, I mean, he's not going to think, oh, you know, he's just making sure I have a nightlight. No, obviously he's going to think, you know, he's trying to kill me. And just, like, eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable when we actually feel fear you know they can they can be reliable if you are a dispassionate observer of you know of, of events but if you see something that scares you you're no longer thinking rationally your brain is just saying get away get away get away you know I like Ray looking at the wall of mirrors trying to find out who she is and the answer basically being she has to define herself. She can't be defined by where she came of, came from as an alternative to Luke seeing himself as Darth Vader. He saw what he was on the path to becoming. She sees her, you know, yeah, she, you know, she went looking for her parents and she sees herself. You know, she she's looking for someone, someone else to tell her how to be and yeah, it should be herself. And I also, I, f I forget who it was, but I saw someone say the reason that Luke hates that part of the island is that it's a mirror. You know, the thing that he, the, the, more than anything, the thing that Luke Skywalker in this movie cannot handle is the way he himself, you know, the, the state he has let himself, um, what's the word? Did, uh, fold to whatever. Yeah, I really gotta speed this up. Okay. I like that, you know, over the, the force time, you know, she's starting to have more sympathy for him, trusting him more, thinking she can turn him. I really appreciate that it is a gradual shift over the course of their interactions. You know, at first, she really does think he's a monster. Luke finds Kylo and Rey holding hands. He uses the Force to destroy the hut. Camera closes in on him and then moves, you know, pulls back to her without cutting. And Adam Driver is gone, so it must have been in camera. He moved when the camera did. Very nicely done. When Luke reveals to Rey what happened that night, it seems like he's really telling the truth. He had to be broken down to tell it. Why would he still be lying at this point? Yoda causes lightning so the tree burns. Yoda's back and he's here to troll Luke yet again. I really missed this Yoda during the prequels. 
like rewatch Empire again. He is he is trolling Luke for you know at at several points in that movie. He's he's just trolling Luke. He's he's not he's not giving Luke what Luke thinks he wants or needs. He's he's doing the you know for sure it, it work. I mean it works out. It works out there. It works out here. You know. The greatest teacher failure is. I'm the greatest teacher? Seriously though, it is 100% true. You learn more from failure than from anything else. This guy made a living selling weapons to the bad guys. And the good. So he's CIA is what you're saying. And Ray gets on the ship so she can get to Kylo and he sensed her arriving or Snow Kid maybe and they do put her in handcuffs. Poe does a mutiny and Billy Lord, Carrie Fisher's daughter, plays one of the characters who's on the side of the mutineers. Leia has zero luck with her offspring in this trilogy, whether it's her character's offspring or the actress's offspring. I appreciate that the movie doesn't constantly feature Snoke. We never spend enough time with him to just become used to him. That would be very boring. Like, honestly, when when it's you know when when they went back when when stop saying when one more time when Kylo and Rey went into the the throne room yeah it's yeah the, there's it's a throne it's a throne room because it has a throne so you know I I actually I hadn't really thought about it but yeah it had been a really long time since we last saw. Snoke at all. Now or never. Now. I like the brief pause before that. This movie's full of trolls. GJ, Luke, Yoda. Fired Will. Will has done absolutely nothing to deserve that, and you know it. I really appreciate that the Praetorian Guard fight as a unit, like the Dormelage, and they're not just standing around waiting for their turn to strike. And one of the Praetorian Guards has, like, a whip thing. Really, really, like, this was a fight where throughout, I did not know what was gonna happen next. Like, I love lightsaber duels. I do. There's one of my favorite things about, like, if, you know, if I have to point to specific things I love about Star Wars, lightsaber duels, you know, near the top, but this, like, I never knew what was going to happen next. Like, at the end of the day, lightsaber, okay, you know, one of them's going to hit the other and, and, you know, swing, try to slash each other. But here, you know, the whip thing that wraps around the lightsaber and like some of them have these spears and at least one has these two like daggers like really really clever and and the fact that some of the Praetorians gang up on like two of them have Kylo like he's he really needs help you know that's yeah and it just I love the fact that they they don't all have the same weapon you know the the because they they wouldn't be as effective if they all had the same weapon. But basically, you know, all of them can come at the same one or two people and be working together. You know, that's that's again the thing. The moment that it's a one on one, well, you know, neither of them can ever be uh, what's the word um, mobbed. And and in this, you know, yeah, like they. It looked like they were going to be able to take out Kylo and then, you know, Rey. I, I, I really, yeah. I forget if that's, if that's where it happened. But there's one point where, like, he, he, Kylo's lightsaber is, like, you know, he can't really do anything. Uh, what's the word? He can't, you know, if, if he, like... He, he can't use the lightsaber to get them, like, pushed away. He can't slash at them or anything because they, you know, they're, they're, 
just blocking it. And so, you know, Ray throws it, he catches it, and, and the, the hand that catches it right in front of the, the head of the Praetorian, so he turns it on, goes right through, just, uh, yeah. And, yeah, you know, once all the Praetorians are dead, you know, Kylo makes his plea, and, and Rey, you know, like, she lifts her hand apparently to reach for Kylo's, but instead she uses telekinesis to, ah, uh, what's it called, to, yeah, to, to try to, yeah, she, she pulls the lightsaber, and then both of them are trying to pull it, and, and, like, you know, it eventually even, like, breaks. I knew, going into this movie, that the movie doesn't end with Rey joining Kylo. But when I saw her lift her hand towards, like, I was like, oh, holy crap, she's gonna do it. She's actually gonna join. Like, yeah, it's, it's such a, yeah. So the Holdo maneuver looks actually yeah I'll just very briefly say I thought the entire yeah I already I already talked about how I loved Acts two and three I guess the last hour of the movie or so was just incredible like so intense so emotionally engaging like I I every step of the way it really like yeah and and this idea of like. You know, instead of when Darth Vader kills, when 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 this trilogy's Darth Vader kills this trilogy's Emperor, it's not at the end of the last movie with nothing left to, you know. I mean, I mean, it's a good it's a good ending, but if we're gonna do it again, let's try to do it earlier so that we can mine some more material out of it. You know. So this time, the Darth Vader doesn't die from killing the Emperor. He kills him at the end of the second movie instead of the third. And then, yeah, you have this thing of, like, what, what is, what's next at that point? And, and that's some, like, at the end of the day, you know, hypothetically, if, if the, I guess Vader would have, like, surrendered, maybe gone on trial or something. But here, like, I was legitimately not sure, yeah. So yeah, the, the Holder Maneuver looks incredible. I do think there should have been an explanation as to why that isn't something that people on either side of the conflict do all the time. You know, why, why isn't that their first move? I don't think it's a problem that it happened so late in this movie because they needed to get close enough to crate for the transport to make it that last bit of the way, but it is a problem for other movies and it is a problem that this movie creates. So... You know, don't don't criticize, don't go back and criticize the other movies for something that this movie brought up. And you know, yeah, they should have just had an explanation. Yes, it does apparently require you to sacrifice yourself, but when it's such an effective attack, you know, it's something that could save so many people. You know, a lot of people would would be willing to do it. I've seen some say that you could just use droids. I don't love sacrificing droids, treating them like. They're, they don't have rights. Just, anyway. They should have just had something to explain why it isn't being used all the time. It's not a spoiler to say that in The Rise of Skywalker, very early on, you know, someone says, the Holdo Maneuver is a one in a million shot. I think that works. I think that should have been in this movie. Now, I've seen some people take that to mean, like, it is difficult to aim. I don't think that's how it's, it's meant. I agree, if that's how it's meant, then it's illogical. Obviously, it would be easy to aim for ships that big. I'm saying maybe it requires something else that is extremely rare and difficult. I, I don't know exactly what it would be, but yeah. Very cool fight between Phasma and Finn. I do have things to say about Finn trying to self-sacrifice, but... I put them in the next section. So what I'll say in this section is it's a very emotional and compelling scene. 
The spark is out. Luke makes one heck of an entrance. I love the scene between Luke and Leia talking about whether Kylo can still be saved. Luke gives C-3PO a wink. Nice moment. And that was apparent. I, I read that, you know, in the script, Luke was just supposed to walk past C-3PO without acknowledging him. And that was where, that was Mark Hamill's limit. He told Ryan Johnson, I can't do that. And so Ryan Johnson said, okay, you do the thing that feels natural to you. I love that the movie doesn't show right away what happens when Luke is fired upon. It seems impossible that he could possibly have survived it. And then not only, you know, does it reveal that he's completely unharmed, he does the fake brushing dust away move. Do you think you got him? I've seen some people say it doesn't make sense that Finn and Rose go back, got back to the rebel base after she crashed into him, but they were focusing entirely on Luke. And honestly, wouldn't you? This time C-3PO actually does manage to save the odds, even though Poe doesn't like hearing them any more than Han did. The resistance forces follow the crystal foxes out of the cave. But then it turns out the hole that the that they run to is too small for the resistance to go through. Holy crap, this movie fits in a lot of all is lost. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. I really love hearing him say that. Now Finn wanted to get back to Rey from the moment he woke up at the start of the film, and now, here at the, only at the very end, he does get back to her. No. Strike me down in anger, and I'll always be with you. Just like your father. Because Kylo was so obsessed with Luke, he fell into Luke's trap and let the Resistance get away, just as Luke knew he would. His hatred is his weakness. His faith in the victory of his side is his weakness, just like the Emperor before him. Room Boy is really inspiring, and the kid's giving great performance, too. I don't get how some people were, like, upset that the movie ends focusing on Room Boy instead of one of the main characters. And the end credits say, in loving memory of our princess, Carrie Fisher, which is very sweet. So, notes taken before watching. I am really ecstatic that this is a sequel. I, I wish that, you know, whether whether it was Ryan Johnson or Colin Trevorrow, I wish it wasn't JJ making, who made the episode 9. Anyway. Let's see. Um... Right, so the movie has empathy for some of the least likable characters. Uh, you know, the the certainly Kylo does some awful things, but we do also understand him, and yeah. So, yeah, in some ways, these new movies are meta-textual, comments on people's nostalgia for the original trilogy. So, yeah, I, I, I go over that in all three of the... Or I, I did in the episode 7, I'm doing it now for episode 8, and I'll do it again for episode 9. So, yeah, in this movie, a love letter to the fans, even though a number of them didn't find it to be... You know, they, they thought it was the opposite. Rey is rewarded for her love of Jedis by getting the information from the Jedi Temple and managing to compel Kylo to kill Snoke. Like, if not for Rey, Kylo wouldn't have done that. And just, you know, even if you want to say absolutely nothing else, he wouldn't have been able to. You know, the fact that he got in the situation...
that was because Snoke was focusing on Ray. He, you know, he was like he's about to strike down his true enemy, and you know, he can't tell that Snoke, that that Kylo considers Snoke his true enemy and not Ray. Now let's see. So IMDb trivia. Oh, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. actually, I guess this was. Well, I should have. Okay, yeah. You know, some online say that because Rose, the start of the movie says that you should sacrifice yourself. For the cause, you know, that's why she won't let Finn escape in an escape pod. Near the end of the movie, she refuses to let Finn sacrifice himself. And, yeah, you know, some people say that means she's not consistently written. But, you know, in the commentary track, the director, you know, he, he says that it means that the character has grown over the course of the movie. And he expresses that it was important for him that the audience believed Finn would really die in the scene. And yeah, the, you know, I certainly did. It seemed like a lot of people thought that he really would, you know, end up dying there. <sighs> Me personally, I mean, I don't think it completely feels earned, the idea that she she grew to to feel that yeah now according to the director of commentary let's say everyone who worked on the movie wanted to be present when they filmed scenes between Luke and Leia and Carrie Fisher wrote the joke about her hair Right, so I've yeah. One critic said that you know Finn goes through the same character arc in this movie that he did in Episode Seven, and you know this this thing of like not only focusing on Ray but helping the the resistance in general. Risking his own safety. For other people and yeah yeah I guess I'm, I'm not sure I can really argue with that and some say that Finn should be with Poe instead of Finn being with Rose and there was definitely there was definitely some chemistry between them in, in episode 7 and then in this they barely share any screen time and Yes, you know, some, some critics said that it's a problem, you know, it's bad that this movie doesn't feature the Knights of Ren. According to Ren Johnson, there, was, there just was not room for them. There's too much else going on. I did see some th theorize that maybe the Praetorian Guard were actually the Knights of Ren. But, yeah, ultimately that's not. Yeah. Now, Linkara points out that Luke Skywalker had, he puts on his Jedi robes when he will, goes to burn the temple. He was wearing that when Rey arrived, so he might have been on his way, to, you know, on, yeah, he might have been going there to burn it before she got there, and then, you know, he basically had to wait until she left. Now, I, is this also, I think this might also be Linkara. Anyway, it's it's a critic who said this. Finn has to learn there's no such thing as being neutral. He has to fight for a side. Otherwise, he's just as bad as DJ and the arms dealer that the that DJ steals the ship from. 
Now, a number of audiences were frustrated that Luke Skywalker didn't use a lightsaber in this movie and that he wasn't physically present when he shows up at the end of the movie, but in the original trilogy, we're specifically told that, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure, yeah, this is what Linkara said, and I agree with him. He, he does some, some really great, yeah. Lightsabers in combat are not the most important for a Jedi. Luke achieves exactly what he hoped to do, the rebels manage to escape. Yes, it kills him spending so much energy, but he saves the, the resistance. He becomes a legend. And it's very similar to how Ben dies in episode four, also to make sure that his allies could escape. You know, if he had actually gone there, like forgetting, you know, let's ignore, let's pretend he has a ship that works. Let's pretend that the X-wing that's buried under the, like clearly that thing's not going to, actually fly after being submerged there for so long you know the thing is completely destroyed with you know and and he actually he took one of the wings to make a door out of like even if he tried to fly it he wouldn't be able to you know so yeah for one thing he can't get to crate for another like if the you know if he actually did go there physically he would have died when they shot, you know, when they fired upon him from the, I'm told, I, I feel like I heard that they're now called gorilla, the, the ones in this movie are called gorilla walkers instead of elephant walkers. And that does make sense. There's some gorilla thing, like, it looks like it's walking on, on knuckles like a gorilla. Rather than the big flat feet that the, the at ats had. Now, one critic said that the fact that Finn and Rose's mission is failure is part of the point. One of the major themes of the movie is how you learn more from failures than success. And part of the movie is that, like Episode 5, they, you know, they, yeah, Episode 5, they also spend the entire movie on something that ends up failing, trying to escape in the Falcon. Both movies are one long chase scene. Obviously, that doesn't mean that just because you like one, you have to like the other. But let's at least be honest, you know, it is, it, it's the same thing in episode 5. Episode 5 is probably my favorite of all the movies, but basically the chase scene exists to give Han Solo and Leia Organa time to flirt and Luke Skywalker time to train as, uh, with Yoda. The fact that they fight so hard to get away and then are caught shows how strong the Empire is and nobody expected the movie to actually have a downer ending. One critic said that the, the Star Wars sequel trilogy are more the, or actually, yeah, that the Star Wars, the Disney Star Wars movies are morally gray. And one said that it, while it isn't the case, it does feel like this movie hates Episode 7 and tries to destroy it. And that's why people who love Episode 7 hates this one, and those who hate Episode 7 love this one. Ryan Johnson is more interested in theme and story, so that's what he focuses on. It's very important to him to shock people with big twists, and some of them are not properly thought through. The three biggest story structure problems with the movie of the subversion of expectations that either change nothing or make it easier for the heroes to win so they don't make, uh, yeah the multiple points of view it's clear that Ryan Johnson is only interested in the Ray and Kylo story and the payoffs too many things in the movie are left so that episode 9 can uh, what's it called can conclude them these three elements are the movie's kryptonite now the logic behind why so much of the movie is dedicated to rebel ships fleeing first order ships but somehow can't catch up to them or go ahead of them or just send out smaller ships to attack doesn't really make sense and the entire plot of the movie hinges on it. This was the first movie where I really thought I that one of the heroes might actually help one of the villains when Kylo appeals to Rey after they killed Snoke and his Praetorian Guard. Throughout the entire movie, everyone fails, good guys and bad guys alike, and the resistance goes from being hundreds or dozens to 20 people. 
there are two action climaxes. Yeah, with the both the the ah, what's it called? Like yeah, the 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 very ending, and before that you have the the Praetorian Guard and that whole thing. And the and the space battle. Most of the surprises I saw coming because they basically had to choose one out of three options to uh, what's it called to conclude something, but there were a few that really surprised me. The scene where children where animals are freed rather than child slaves seems like it's written by a child. It's too naive. Ryan Johnson wrote the script to answer the things the fans thought were important after episode 7. Even when those things went against things in episode 7 and some of what he wrote criticized fan theories like how you know Ray isn't related to anyone important. When the good guys arrive on Crate. It feels like we started a new movie and it's too reminiscent of the start of episode 5. And yeah, so the following a lot of people have pointed out why does one of the soldiers taste the planet and note that it's salt? Like that is such a strange thing. It, it, yeah. Some, some critics say the original characters from episodes 4 through 6 are only here to be humiliated, they're not part of the plot. Um, many of the characters in the movie in general have almost no effect on the plot. The movie doesn't even have a lightsaber duel in the traditional sense. Luke Skywalker is the rare example of a movie father figure that we love and trust admitting that he failed. Luke has to learn to not try to control those he teaches. Maybe Ryan Johnson wanted Ray to take Kylo's hand and Disney freaked and refused. I d definitely, that would have been very interesting. I, th I think there's some chance that that, yeah, that would have been tremendously interesting. If this movie ended with basically Rey and Kylo, you know, set up as the main villains of, or at the very least, as uh, as not wanting to help the resistance. Let's, let's go with that. And then, you know, maybe not working with the First Order either, but yeah. Instead of Luke Skywalker, let's convince... Considering killing Kylo while he slept, it should have been that he was as optimistic as he was before, had too much trust in Kylo, left Kylo alone, kills, so, and kill, Kylo kills some Jedi, the others he converts to be evil, so you still have Luke Skywalker living alone and no longer training Jedi when Rey shows up. I do have a problem with some of the sloppy writing of the movie. Yeah, some people felt that you know, the reveal that Rose loves Finn was completely out of nowhere. In the end, the director didn't want to make a space movie. He wanted to make a World War II movie with the concept of atmosphere and gravity. If you don't want to make a space movie, then don't sign up to make an effing space movie. I, I do think that the you know that there is some there are some frustrating aspects there
the whole resistances on the run plot is idiotic. Why are they running? Shouldn't the first order be on the run after Starkiller Base was destroyed? There's literally nothing to stop the rest of the galaxy from teaming up to curb stomp their asses. It's like if after the success of D-Day, the Allied forces ran away from France and the Axis powers chased them across the Atlantic. I can't really argue with it. Like, yeah, that is, that is a, yeah. Before you react to the following, please listen to the whole thing. One of the reasons that a lot of people have a visceral reaction to this movie is because of the following. For us progressives, it's that Star Wars is calling out some of the injustice that the movies just haven't called out before. It's not that they were in favor of it, but they haven't called it out before now. Now they are in a movie that Wikipedia says costs somewhere between 200 and 317 million dollars, which by itself doesn't make the movie good. And for conservatives, it's that characters that they highly identify with, including Luke Skywalker, Poe Dameron, and for a number of them, Finn and Kylo. Not for his negative qualities, but for the positive ones that he keeps trying to repress, are humiliated, and sometimes their humiliation lies in them being called out by female characters. But if you pay close attention, ultimately Luke Skywalker and Poe Dameron help save the day, Finn does what he can to save the day, and Kylo does help save Rey's life. Okay, now you can react. Uh, I gotta figure out, my back is absolutely killing me right now. Um, let's see, is there a lot left? There is a bunch left, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really write, like I know some, ah, uh, okay, here we go, yeah, okay, I think I can get through it, yeah, I'm just gonna speed run some of this. I don't really sit down and write a script of a certain amount of words and then figure out, okay, so, yeah, the, it's the, what's it called, you know, that's so and so many words so that should take so and so long to I just kind of write everything I think in the so yeah okay let's see I am I I guess that is more or less. Yeah, I'm looking for the. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So, I don't personally mind that we don't know more about Snoke before he dies. You know, he's not as interesting as Kylo. And I'm glad that this movie ends with him dead. If the movie ended with him and Kylo still working together, we'd expect Episode Nine to end with, you know, Kylo betraying him. And we'd spend those two years just expecting the movie to end, expecting to know exactly how the saga ended. That would be incredibly boring. But since this ends with him dead, but Kylo still, like, a, a villain, you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to end. And, let's see. 
yeah, I, I'm not going to discuss in this video whether or not I'm satisfied with how Episode 9 ends. Now, you might be thinking, that's just because you haven't watched the movie yet. And you'd be right. I have heard spoilers about it, I haven't watched it yet, so I can't say with certainty what I think, and I'm not going to spoil that movie in this video either, but... Oh, never mind, that was the end of that note. I should have read that in my mind before I started reading it out loud. So obviously a lot of people hate that when Ray hands Luke the lightsaber, not only does he not show any respect for the lightsaber, but he and the movie decides to show this through a literal throwaway gang. I do think that it was necessary and, you know, necessary to reveal that Luke was a completely different person now, and it was a good idea to make it clear from right away. You know, he changed because of the trauma, you know, yeah, just like in real life, trauma can fundamentally change a person. And, you know, I, I mentioned in my video on episode 7, I don't think it's interesting just to bring characters back that the audience, you know, recognizes. Some fans can't stand that, you know, Luke lives alone and he's not training the next generation of Jedi, but he almost fell to the dark side and killed his nephew, who then fell to the dark side and killed some of the Jedi that he was training, you know, that, like, the, his character and his character arc in the original trilogy tells us that he is someone who gets overexcited and emotional sometimes, and actually, like, he, it was basically pure luck that Vader didn't kill him at, or, or I, actually, I suppose Vader wasn't trying to kill him. No, the, the the fact that he survives letting himself drop, you know, that was pure luck. And at the end of the Empire, and in in Return of the Jedi, he does very nearly kill his father, and he does it not because he calmly and you know logically reasoned, oh, this is the best thing. No, it's because you know he said. You, your sister, perhaps, if you cannot turn, perhaps she will. And then he unleashes upon him. You know, I, I think it makes sense that, yeah. Now, I, yeah, I think it would have been boring if Luke in this movie was just, just like Yoda. You know, when, when we find out, you know, when you watch Empire and, like, we're told, oh, you know, he's one of the best Jedi. You know, like, Luke comes in, he's expecting, like, some someone who looks really badass, some some kind of, like, I don't know, uh, 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 Schwarzenegger or a Stallone, some, someone who looks impressive, looks like they could kick anyone's ass. And he comes in, and it's this little, you know, tiny little, like, he's part of the training he spends with Yoda on his back, like Yoda, Yoda's the size of a toddler, you know, you see him and you're like, that's the Master Jedi, you know, if Luke in this movie was just the same as that, where would the subversion be? I really love that Yoda is a puppet, just like in the original trilogy, and it is even Frank Oz puppeteering him again. I don't think it was ever you know, Frank Oz doing the voice, he's done that in all of them, these movies. I don't know about the uh, animated shows, but in all the live-action movies, he's doing the voice, but he didn't puppeteer him in episodes two and three. Now, some people criticize this movie, saying it's bad that it has a message. Now, it's perfectly fine to disagree with the message, but Star Wars has always been about com communicating moral lessons. It's just that there's a number of people who love the original trilogy, some even who love the prequel trilogy, but who do not like and agree with the moral lessons in the new movies. Again, that's fine, but it's kind of silly to claim that Star Wars only just got political with the sequel trilogy and spin-off movies. You're telling me a stormtrooper and a girl did what now? Okay, I'll start over. They walk into a bar. 
We win not by fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. I really appreciate that sentiment. I do. But I think the delivery was overly cheesy. It's really too bad because so many people think that we improve things just by stopping the other side and don't focus enough on what our own side has to offer. Another problem with how the movie delivers this message, it doesn't feel like there really is a romantic relationship there. They don't have that kind of chemistry. The fact that Luke ignited his lightsaber close to Kylo and that he has difficulty telling Rey but Kylo tells her is very similar to how Ben didn't tell Luke that Darth Vader was his father but said that Darth Vader killed his father. Now, so yeah, Luke ignites his lightsaber, appears to be about, you know, un, just about to, to kill his student. I think he might have to give his year's best teacher award back. So the reason Admiral Holdo doesn't tell Poe what the strategy is, is she thinks there's a spy. She doesn't necessarily think that he is the spy, but that the spy could, you know, pick up on the strategy if she starts sharing it with anyone. So the some people say that Ray has no flaw, but in this movie, she's clearly she's way too optimistic and like idealistic. Like she's she's convinced that she could turn Kylo. And, you know, not only does she fail to turn Kylo, like, her, like, she, she gets delivered right to the, the, to, I almost called him the Emperor, right to Snoke's throne room. The, you know, ultimately, the, that does lead to Snoke's death, but it could extremely easily have led to her own death as well. And then the resistance would have lost one of the most one of the most powerful of their members now let's, let's see. let the past die kill it if you have to a number of audience members thought this was the movie's point but the bad guy says it so he's wrong I've seen some people question why do the Praetorian Guard attack after Snoke is dead. Their argument being, well, the leader's already dead, so they don't have any reason to fight. They're not going to get anybody's approval by fighting or punishment for not fighting. The way I see it, there, there are a couple of different options. One is they're so extremist that they're convinced that Snoke was the, you know, should be the leader, and because of that, you know, like, it's almost like he, like, like, um, like Kylo killed their family member. They want revenge. There, another option, maybe they think that Kylo and Rey are going to kill them. Maybe not right now, maybe later. And to be sure that, you know, maybe later to be, to make sure that the Praetorians don't kill them. And in that case, it's only natural to attack first. You know, who really wants to be running away from Kylo Ren, especially if until recently they, you know, like, like they might have thought, oh, okay, we're, we're safe. Because we're with Snoke. Yeah, but he's just killed Snoke, you know, like at that point. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you've been working on the same side as, as Kylo, you know how strong you are, and you don't have an... Let's see. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that it could be all of these things. I'm saying I think it's at least one of these explains it. Now, so since Kylo Ren has disappointed Snoke multiple times, you know, yeah, he criticizes the helmet. The way I see it, he's hated the helmet for a long time. But he thought he could get more out of Kylo than he has. So he just couldn't keep it 
to himself anymore. And, you know, with the helmet on, he's Kylo Ren. No one can see if, if he has any doubts. But without the helmet, you know, the it's literally plain on his face. And it's important for this movie that we, the audience, can really see his inner conflict. We can see that he's having a harder and harder time hiding this conflict. When he smashes the helmet, he's not thinking, oh, now other people can see my conflict. He's smashing it because Snoke, you know, mocked him, and he wants Snoke's acceptance. It's, it's it has very, you know, high school, middle school, you know, I really want to be accepted by the popular crowd energy. But yeah, the fact that he sm smashes the helmet communicates to the audience that he's having a hard time hiding it. You know, literally, the thing that he used to hide his his doubts is now gone. I've seen some say that it does make sense that Luke couldn't tell Han being killed, but, you know, that's part of the point. He's been so... he, he uses the Force so little that he couldn't sense it, and... That's something that Ryan Johnson talks about. You know, it destroys Luke emotionally that he couldn't. Yes, some of the new Force power use is silly, but as as Cinema Winds pointed out, it's literally you know literally every Star Wars episode. Yeah, every movie that has Star Wars episode in the title introduces at least one completely new either power or aspect of the force. Now Captain Phasma is barely in the movie and dies in a way that is not satisfying for the audience, so compared her to Boba Fett, which you know presumably means she's gonna get a Disney Plus show that shows that she didn't die 35 years after the movie came out. And uh, the role being, being played by the same actor, seriously though, I I get why people were frustrated that she was in so little of it, especially when the actress was talking about how important she was in interviews. I, I don't blame the actress. She, you know, the moment that they send the actress out in interviews, she has to come up with something to say. I'm not sure there's very much she could have said about her character that would both be true and wouldn't be incredibly unsatisfying. Now, let's see. She still hates Finn, I guess, is, is one. You know, I, I think it's basically, you know, she looks cool and, you know, she definitely, she did and said a couple of really important things in Episode 7. But she's, you know, she wasn't supposed to be important there. She, she's there to sell toys, let's be honest. She has a cool, different look so that they could sell toys of that. And, I mean, JJ, if, if you want to talk about, you know, oh, she, she died, she didn't get very much to do, JJ killed her. It's The fact that she's back in this is beyond absurd. I, I honestly don't think she should have been in this at all. I, I don't know if it was Ryan Johnson's idea or, you know, some... I, I get why she was popular. And I I wouldn't... Like, maybe, maybe a Disney Plus show starring her would be cool, but I don't... How are they going to give her very much to do in these movies? Now, The Force Awakens introduced her and implied she was important. This movie didn't have anything important to do. It probably shouldn't have included her at all. That would have been the best. Now, I really like that this movie says that ordinary people can become heroes. Ray is not related to anyone important. Rose is a regular person. Finn, Poe Dameron, you know, none of them, like, came from something. You know, it's not about who you're related to. You don't have to be a politician, royalty, or related to someone who's powerful with the Force. I'm not saying there was something wrong about that being the case in the original trilogy, but I do think it would be wrong to still hold on to that today. Back then, it was important to communicate 
what's good, what's evil, and one way to do that is by saying, you know, the 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 good guys are royalty, want to save royalty, or belong to the right religion, but today there's entirely too many people who think that normal people can't be important, and it's important that we can't be important. You have to be a politician, you need a college degree, you need to be related to someone important, and if you can't live up to that, well, you're not allowed to use ideas or words to fight the people who do have these. And, you know, don't get me wrong, obviously it's only ever okay to use more violent methods if it is literally impossible to, if, if nothing else at all could possibly have a result. You know, a number of people today think that you're not worth as much, you're not as important if you don't have a lot of power, and this is a huge problem. You know, in, uh, when it is in a number of Western countries, including America, extremely difficult to become rich and powerful if you're born into a poor family. There's a system that, you know, means that the, the relatively few people who have power still have power. And no, I'm obviously not talking about the Jews. I'm talking, it's, you know, a number of them are white. There are no evil ethnic groups. And, and you know, because the power doesn't change hands, things don't improve for the people who are currently not powerful, powerless, currently powerless. And, you know, I'm sure a number of the people who love the original trilogy imagined that they themselves were one of these powerful people. And they felt that this movie said that it was wrong to think like that. And they, you know, they weren't more important than other poor people that they may be subconsciously looked down upon. I understand why they thought it was, that was a provocative statement. I find it kind of frustrating that Ray is captured and tortured. You know, I, I guess, I guess technically in episode seven, it wasn't, I, I don't know, I guess it was a form of mental torture. But yeah, you know, two movies in a row. The you know someone uses the force to to torture her mind, trying to get information out of her mind. Two movies in a row. Both of the movies that she, like they didn't even have. Yeah, when when part of the point of her character is the strong female character. I don't think Mark Hamill is necessarily the best authority on what Luke would become. Yes, he's lived with the character since 1977. But as far as I can tell, Ryan Johnson, who was born in 1973, has been a fan since childhood, so he's loved the character almost as long. He se Mark seems very resistant to the idea that Luke would ever become this bitter. When I feel the writing of this movie does a really good job selling that, and Ray can inspire hope in future generations. It's not like this trilogy doesn't have any character that can do that. With that said, it is sad that Mark Hamill is this unhappy, as unhappy as he apparently is with how this movie handles his character. I've seen videos where he seems to feel genuine anxiety at what has been done to the character, and my heart does go out to him. Now, I mentioned that maybe it would have been best if Captain Phasma didn't show up in this movie at all, and it did seem like she died in the... Let's see. Yeah, the, the, yeah, in, in episode seven, you know, they threw in a trash compactor. According to New Hope, you know, those things crush you. If, if you know, the only reason that the, the good guys survived in, in, a, in a New Hope was that, you know, R2D2 managed to, to stop the crushing in time. And Starkiller base blew up afterwards. There's no way she should still be alive. It's it's completely ridiculous. Now I heard some ask why would Luke be a jerk to Ray, which for sure he is. He is a huge a-hole to her. We're shown this stuff mostly from Ray's perspective. We didn't see him on this journey. Try to think of it from his perspective. He feels like Kylo, who's now murdered quite a few people, 
and is partially responsible for Starkiller, which murdered millions, was his fault. And then this stranger comes to him with a lightsaber that his father murdered dozens of children with, and basically asks him to be someone he's not, and someone that he feels great shame that he is not. So I would say emotionally it makes sense for him to treat her like that, and also logically, because he's because he's trying to deter her from this, he looks at her and thinks, is she going to be another Darth Vader? Honestly, it's kind of wild that he doesn't destroy the lightsaber instead of merely throwing it away. I guess the reason is that they needed it to be intact for this movie. Or maybe that would have been perceived as being, as being one step too far. Now, some people criticize that Ray translates Chewbacca, you know, for Luke. I agree that it would make good sense if Luke, you know, could understand Chewbacca, but if it's been a lot of years, or uh, yeah, at least used to under uh, understand Chewbacca's, what's it called, Shiri book, I would say. But, you know, it, it's been years since he last communicated with him, so it's completely credible that he forgot. Like, we forget languages that we don't use. That's that's just how that works. You know, if, the, if you don't keep something... It, it can happen even if you do. But if you don't keep using knowledge that you have, it will eventually, you know... Like, the brain, you, you can't keep... You can't keep adding information to the brain infinitely. You know, when you when you learn something, you know, after a certain point, when when you learn a new thing, you have to get rid of an old thing, and you know, the brain will just basically go with, well, you know, haven't used that in a while, so I guess you know. Now, other than the fact that obviously a lot of people don't like that. This, you know, in addition to Luke Skywalker being bitter and, yeah, having become bitter and remaining bitter for most of the movie, he says that the future should not have Jedi. The way I see it, it reflects the fact that there are institutions in the real world that have failed. And a lot of young people today feel like we have to make fundamental systemic change. And, you know, this is... This is a movie where Luke Skywalker tells them you're right. You know, that this is like just yeah. You know, this yeah, this is a character that they for for a long time for many years have considered a role model. Again, Star Wars has always been something that could comment on what is the right way to do things and what is the wrong way. Now, I saw someone criticize that apparently in, in an interview Daisy Ridley said everyone has the force the way I see it you know she's what that means is everybody has the power to make a difference which is a good you know value to teach you know George Lucas has said he makes these movies for 12 year olds it's not him making the movies anymore, but they're probably still a lot, you know, 12 year olds are a, a big chunk of the audience. Now, I've seen some say that it doesn't make sense for Ray trying to see something positive in someone's evil is kind of Ren. The way I see it, she herself, many times in her life, has been perceived negatively. Maybe not as evil, but as weak or useless or something. And she's scared of treating someone else that way you know having from from having a negative yeah treating someone else badly because she had a, a negative in, impression on them because you didn't give them enough of a chance to prove that the you know that they are more Now, I guess... Yeah, okay, so I will just very briefly... Spoilers for Episode 9. The end of Episode 9. 
you know, at the very end, she does manage to get Kylo to turn on the Emperor, which would not have been possible if she considered him 100% evil. No more spoilers for the time being. So, yeah, you know, again, the movie is saying there's some truth to that. Now, I've actually, I, f I forget who, but I saw someone theorize maybe the reason Luke died from projecting onto, uh, uh, what's it called? Yeah, the, the, maybe Luke died from, from the, the duel because Kylo hurt him during the, the duel, the way that there's rain from Octo to Kylo. I get that they wanted Carrie Fisher to be Leia in Episode Nine, and maybe it would have been too dark for her to die when the spaceship exploded, but I do think it was a mistake to not let her character die in this movie, considering that the actress died in real life. Now, I've heard that for Episode Nine they had to use footage that they hadn't used from Episode Seven and Eight, since you know obviously they couldn't make new, and it's really bad. It's, yeah, it, it was obviously a bad idea. And it, yeah. I think part of the reason Rey is so good at using the Force is she's been imagining, maybe not being a full-fledged Jedi, but a part of one, since she was a child. And the fact that she acted at, like she could do these things was, you know, not, obviously not true. It's not quite equivalent to training, but it was a sort of training. You know, the reason Luke only becomes good at it after, you know, like, we see him meet Ben Kenobi. From what I recall, Luke doesn't even know much at all about Jedi and the Force before Ben explains it to him. So that's why Luke isn't already really great at it. He didn't even know it was possible. But Rey, you know, she's been, yeah, She's, when she was younger, she would, like, act like she could, you, you know, use telekinesis and mind trick people and such. And so when she comes of age, you know, yeah, she, and, and tries to do it in real life, yeah. I'm just, I'm going to talk some about how some people can't stand that Ray is so powerful with the Force. So let's just for some comparisons. At nine years old, Anakin Skywalker had inhumanly quick reactions because of the Force. Some people say that, you know, that doesn't mean that Rey should be able to use telekinesis and mind tricks, which, I mean, at the end of the day, that's subjective. I'm not saying you can't think that, but why is one more credible and, and a credible untrained use of the force than the other mind tricks is like hypnosis on steroids and hypnosis is the thing people can actually do you just you know you need training and the right circumstances and and you know we can definitely agree that Anakin's inhumanly fast reactions is something he uses for considerably longer at a time during pod racing compared to Ray using telekinesis or mind tricks for a few seconds and you know just days after you know first learning first learning that the Jedi and Force exist Luke Skywalker can make a one in a million shot without his targeting computer how's that supposed to be a smaller achievement than the little bit of force use that Ray does in episode seven. And, you know, in this one, I, I, you know, in this one, we see her getting, you know, she doesn't get that much training, but she does get some. And, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, like, again, it's just, you know, she, she could do telekinesis at the end of episode seven. In this one, she gets a lot of, like, what's it called? she get she can do it with bigger things but it's still it's still just telekinesis you know and yeah you know luke helped her reach
or potential. I I was originally going to read at least the top 100 most voted most useful IMDb user reviews, but I couldn't get through, you know, yeah, I, I couldn't get through the top 25 before I found 10 that included racism and fat phobia, so I just stopped, you know, there's, I, I'm not going to subject myself to that. I'm not saying that the majority of people who didn't like the movie are racists and, you know, yeah, fat, fat phobia. Clearly, there are a number of reasons to, you know, dislike, even hate this movie. There are problems with this movie. What I'm saying is, if the racist and fat phobic ones were not the majority, you know, that it, it would be a good way to point out that that's not the majority. If the rest of the people who hate this movie could try to get, yeah, the really toxic ones in line. You know, one, one way to do that would be to vote down the reviews that are fat phobic and racist. A number of them don't even say anything about the movie. They're just short racist insults against Rose and Kelly Marie Tran. Now it's only fair for someone on the left like me to call, you know, when when I call out those on the right, I'm not saying can't be on the left and also, you know, dislike the movie. I'm saying the following is addressed to those on the right who dislike the movie and ask that they challenge the toxic parts of their party, that I do the same for those on the left who are toxic. So I'll say here what I've said before and I'll probably say again, if you're someone who's saying that it's fine that anti-vaxxers die and we shouldn't try to help them, stop saying that. We as human beings, regardless of political affiliation, are better than that. If you're someone who's already trying to fight toxic parts of the fandom, thank you. Please keep going. I'm especially grateful if you're not one of the people who, while not themselves racist, pretend like there isn't a huge chunk of the people who hate this movie, and the new ones in general, that are incredibly racist, fatphobic, and generally hateful. Anyone claiming that it's everyone who dislikes or hates the sequel trilogy is wrong, but they are there. And they are very loud. I realize not everybody agrees with the following, but I do think a strong case could be made that it shouldn't be allowed to put hate speech on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Metacritic, Reddit. Some of these have done some to, to address it, but yeah, I, I guess I'm saying it shouldn't be on any of these. And you know, each of the each of the ones I've just mentioned had has had at least some hate speech. It hurts too many people in real life to be okay. At the very least, like remove those parts from the reviews posted. Possibly go as far as suspend the users and remove their reviews. Now I've seen some criticize a holdover being angry at Poe. They grant that it cost a lot of resistance members' lives, but they've that if he hadn't done it, then the dreadnought that he destroyed would have killed the rest of the resistance. And yeah, I right. I yeah, I heard someone say that Holdo thought Poe was the mole, since a number of moles are actually war heroes that turned. I heard someone say, how does Rose know Finn destroyed our killer base? It happened hours ago. You don't think something like that would spread like wildfire? Some people ask, why are the rich in the casino considered evil when they sell weapons to both good and evil? Because they're also selling to the evil. They, they could have chosen to only sell to good. And, you know, maybe request that some of the payment for the weapons would be protection against the First Order, or they could sell to both and maybe only sell weapons that don't work to the Empire. You can't be neutral when you both have, you know, when when you have weapons that you could give to either side and one of the sides is fascist and you still give weapons to them. 
Some criticize that Rose is preventing uh, members of the resistance from you know, fleeing the ship, saying, well, if they're volunteers. First of all, are we certain that they're volunteers? Like, I, I wouldn't rule out that they were recruited as a normal army, but even if they were volunteers, we're not just talking about, oh, they're going to physically walk away from the camp. They're using escape pods. They're, you know, they're stealing from the resistance movement. Like, I get, I, I empathize with their situation, but at the end of the day, that is, you know, that is essentially literally what they signed up for. Like, it would be one thing, like, let's hypothetically say that their superior officer were, was torturing them or something. That's not what they signed up for. But being attacked by the enemy, that is literally what they said. Yeah. Anyway, I've seen a number of people express frustration that some of the things that the heroes and villains say in the movie, you know, Luke says the Jedi and Seth are equally bad. Based on things he says later in the movie, I'd say that the movie isn't giving him right. It isn't saying that he's right about that. They're saying he's become so bitter that he can't tell anymore that there's a difference. You know, I think they might be getting at the following. Decades ago, when boomers were young, one of the ideas that really weren't really questions was that the CIA and the American police force were the good guys. But today we know the CIA have destabilized a lot of countries with their vital role in coups that, well, coups that only benefited the CIA and their partners. And the police in America, along with police forces in other Western countries, have been and continue to be brutal to minorities while serving and protecting mainly the wealthy, but also conservatives who are not wealthy. Now, these realizations might lead one to despair, like Luke Skywalker does, but it is more healthy to simply say that we have to reform, to attempt to change something that is currently bad. And the way the movie communicates this idea is that Rey does try to change someone who's bad, Kylo Ren. She makes some progress, but it is more difficult than she initially thought. She does help take out Snoke, but Kylo tries to tempt her with another harmful idea, that it should all be burnt to the ground. She realizes that that's going too far. So it's wrong to despair. It's wrong to simply destroy everything that it is. The solution in real life, pro you know, real life problems must be found in the middle between those two extremes. Or not necessarily in the middle, but somewhere between those two extremes. Centrism sucks. It's too bad that the slow chase scene that much of the movie consists of doesn't make that much sense compared to the rules because, you know, basically they wanted something similar to episode 5. The circumstances are somewhat different, but, you know, these are both movies where the heroes spend the entire movie trying to get away from the bad guys. And at the very end, you know, some of them get away, but not all. And... You know, part one of the things that's different, you know, in this movie, there's an expectation that there's more action scenes today. If this movie had as few, as small, and as brief action scenes as episode five, yeah, people, you know, it wouldn't have been considered sufficient. So they couldn't just have had exactly the same thing. Honestly, I wouldn't rule out that they might have... Well, I guess maybe Ryan Johnson... Anyway. Yeah, the, the you know, episode 5, again, it's my second favorite Star Wars movie, but the heroes basically don't accomplish anything in the movie. Luke gets a little bit of training, Han Leia flirts, much of what Yoda tries to teach Luke, he doesn't actually learn several of the most important tests. He doesn't pass. He fails hard. It's true that in this movie, the characters also don't accomplish a lot, but at least it explores some themes. Episode 5 tells us more about the Force. It explores some of the character flaws, but overall, it's not, not a lot is accomplished in that movie. Again, I love it. I watched it recently more than once, more than I had to, but, you know, the, and I think for, for the time it came out, it achieved, you know, that, that was the expectation, like, it, if it had much more, it would have been exhausting for people back then, you know, this movie has the same strengths as episode five, and some new ones, 
I think the reason Yoda can cause lightning is that it's an island that's strong with the force. He shouldn't be able to do it anywhere else other than other places that are strong with the force. And obviously, you know, if he can summon lightning anywhere, he should be, you know, on, on crate shooting lightning at gorilla walkers. I saw someone criticizing Kylo Ren going from killing Snoke and telling Rey you should abandon the, you know, Jedi and Sith and that, and Jedi, Sith, and such, to fighting with the First Order again. I think it's because he feels betrayed when Rey says no to him, and then he goes back to something that gives him a sense of comfort. Now, Episode 8 clearly does not want to follow all the stuff that Episode 7 set up. It's kind of like watching the Josh Whedon Justice League after watching the Snyder Cut. There's stuff that, that's written that very clearly references and tries to adjust something that the writer or director was unhappy with from the other writer or director's vision. Now, I've seen some criticize Ray being so good at shooting from the Millennium Falcon when she appears at the end of the movie because we didn't see her practice. I mean, she had time to practice all the time that they spent with her flying to Octo. You know, we were told there's a very long distance between. I honestly, I don't remember what the where they where she flew from at the end of Episode Seven, but yeah, that and then Octo, like it's supposed to be. Um, Yeah, you know, the, the, she could have been practicing shooting during that. Like, I feel like if the, that thing that's, you know, the, the shield thing and the droid that shoots the, you know, that you practice deflecting, you know, that, that skill with the lightsaber, you know, I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain yet, wait, I, let's see, it shows up both in episode 4 and in, I want to say, episode 2, so I guess it's a Jedi thing and not a Falcon thing, but, but, yeah, the way I see it, it would make sense that the, the Falcon would have, like, the ability to, like, throw out, like, I don't know, tennis balls, something equivalent to tennis balls out the back of the, the ship, so that you can use those for target practice. Now, I've seen some say that Luke Han and Leia should have been the leads in this trilogy, with all due respect, and I have a lot of respect for the elderly, but they just, they, they could not do the kind of action scenes that were, that, you know, are expected today from action blockbusters, and then they'd essentially have to do like, you know, in episode two when Count Dooku fights, you know, just use a stuntman, put the face on the special effects, and that's not satisfying to watch. And at least in episode two, it was only for the little bit of action that Dooku took part in. He wasn't in action throughout the entire film. Lucas understood this. If you're angry that Luke, Han, and Leia weren't the leads, be angry that Lucas didn't make or let someone else make a sequel trilogy decades ago. I understand that some people did not like that Hux became a joke in this movie since he was so intense, some to Hitler in episode 7. I appreciate that the way he was turned into it was very accurate to the actual Hitler. At one point he ends up lying on the floor on his stomach. All that was missing was him gnawing on carpet and the fact that it's not his own frustration that leads him lying there, but Snoke being frustrated with him. You know, he makes some terrible military decisions in real life he didn't get that much open disrespect from the people he worked with but some of them did realize how ridiculous he is now let's see so yeah the yeah too many characters too many story setups in episode 7 this movie elects to ignore some and, you know, others are changed, you know, for, yeah, for making General Hux so ridiculous, he could no longer work as a villain the way that we accept that he doesn't get between, yeah, yeah, so that he's no longer the main villain, so we can focus on Snoke and Kylo. There might have been a contract, otherwise I think it would have been, 
if if not for like a contract thing, I think this movie should have just started with Kylo executing Hux. You know, because his death star, death star didn't work. Maybe to prove himself to Snoke, but then without it working. But I could imagine there was probably a, a contract saying that he had to be in all three. So this is yet another of the many action blockbusters that have huge explosions that don't hurt important characters. But this is one of the worst ones because it's a giant spaceship that's being destroyed. And it's extremely close to, to hurting the major characters, but they just barely survive and without getting badly hurt. You know, Rose and Finn, when Phasma is on the way to, to execute them, like, how does it go from, like, all these stormtroopers around, and then Holdo's, hold, you know, Holdo, hold, Holdo no longer holds off on the Holdo maneuver, flies through all these ships, and, you know, suddenly, okay, so Phasma, there's still Phasma and some stormtroopers, but otherwise everything around them, you know, stormtroopers are gone and there's, like, holes in, in the ship, but the, the good guys didn't get hurt. It's just, yeah. Now, let's see. So the throne room fight literally set YouTuber Jill Barrow on a new path, which she clearly enjoys, and her content is excellent. It was before as well, but I'm getting off topic. Now, some people say that it's a problem that this movie does not leave a lot that Episode Nine could use to close off the trilogy. For example, Snoke shouldn't die without another villain to replace him, and Rey is told she wasn't born of someone important, but it wouldn't have been that difficult to write Episode Nine so that Kylo was the villain, that he considers it, you know, the best way to improve the world. Maybe he wants to create a world without Jedi or Sith or something. And the movie is about how Rey processes the fact that she isn't, you know, I get it's, yeah, it's probably not as much the fact that she wasn't, hmm. And anyway, process the fact that she wasn't, that her parents were nobody and they, you know, they didn't hate, uh, they didn't love her. They they sold her for drinking money. You know, it could be about how, you know, her learning that some people get more joy out of life from the people that they meet over the course of their lives rather than the family they were born into. So, that is it for this entire video. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put up one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about an episode, the most, you know, the episode I most recently watched of The Mandalorian. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.